Hello, everybody. If it's Wednesday, it's Warhammer, and that must mean it's time for a belated episode of Warhammer Weekly. Sorry for a little bit of a delay. It's some technical issues. Fun, unique thing that for the first time in 160 plus episodes happened with YouTube. So, hey, life's funny. Anyway, we're here. You're here. We're going to talk about uh, Mixed Order. That's what we're going to do. And uh, to join me, I have, of course, my ever-present and constant co-host, the the solid rock at my side, my own personal Peter. It's Tom. How you doing, buddy? Hey, friends. He's super hammered right now, by the way. I'm just getting that out of the way, setting the expectations. He's been working his way through mules all day. Don't let Tom fool you. He's, he's three sheets in. So there you go. Also joining us, a man who literally has built a career on YouTube out of getting drink it, drinking and talking about Warhammer. It's Paul Conti. How you doing, brother? What's up, nerds? <laughs> I am drinking on a Wednesday night. That's how I'm doing. There you it's go. A, that's like drink, day drinking for grownups. Sure, sure, absolutely. Look, we're all adults here. It's fine. So we're going to talk about mixed order. But of course, to begin with, uh, we're going to talk about some news. So Tom, take us away, brother. Oh, do we have news? We do. It's a big week. I would just like to point out that I know nothing about the news because I have not been paying attention. So this is all going to be news to me, too. Yeah. So you get the, the authentic audience analog reaction with me live. Good, good, good. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so GW, uh, I can only say in response to our... Uh, our my 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 calling it last week on the rumor engine mm -mm, mm -mm. Uh, dropped some uh, some more confirmation for us that uh, that those squigs are coming. Yeah. Vince, so would we like to roll look at the that picture? Roll that squig B roll footage. <laughs> Absolutely, sure. Here we go. So let's take a look at our squig footage here. Uh, this is obviously the rumor engine from this week. There we go. Boom. Yep. I mean, it's definitely a squig mouth. Like, there's no <laughs> doubt about that. It is that. Yeah, it is a squig mouth. Now, whether that's 40K or whether that's AOS, you know, whatever. I don't care. Like, it's probably actually 40K, which is the irony here. <laughs> I, I suspect so. I suspect it's a 40K orc squig. Like, what I'll say is this is actually a really zoomed in picture, right? Because mm -hmm. you can see, like, the, the, the pink strokes. strokes here really clearly. Like, these are massive. Also, did you notice how many teeth he has? Like yeah, on his top row? Not a lot, right? So like if this it's were a, a very small model, probably. Exactly. If this were a big squig, he'd have lots of teeth. We wouldn't be able to see this level of like where they had layered the paint, right? And stuff like that. And these little wash marks here. So I, I'm saying this is like a, a little, you know, 40K orcs classically have squigs too that follow them around or that are attack squigs and stuff like that. So it could mm -hmm. also just be a meth head squig. It could be. It just lost some teeth. Yeah, I mean, look, meth is a hell of a drug, so don't do drugs, kids. Yeah. Um, I would point everyone back to, like, the other two rumor engines we've had for a while. Remember that big, like, tank tread, truck yeah. tread thing? You, you know what I mean? From last yeah. year? Yeah. Uh, so, like, there's clearly been some 40K orcs in the, in the pike for a long time. Indeed. And so this could be along with that same release, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, be. I really think it's 40K. <laughs> like, as much as I was like, that's a gas squig last week, and I really think it was a gas squig, um, this is this is probably a 40K squig. And this is probably coming soon. The rumor is that the 40K, like, orc release is coming this summer, I heard. So. It would make sense, given, like, the release pace and where they are with the yep. books, it would fit. Yep. So, uh I, that sounds cool to me. I mean, the orcs in 40k are obviously like some of the only fun things in 40k, a very dour universe. So, yeah. sounds cool. Make me I'm in. I mean, I'm level. not really in, but sure. I mean, it could present more options for conversion for right. an, for an eventual Moon Clan release down the road, right? Like right. having more different squig uh, and bit and orc bits and stuff like that is never a bad thing, even. And that's a is. great transition, Vince. Indeed, it is. All right. Because, because we have uh, some rumors of releases. Boy, did they come flooding in this week. Yeah, either people got really bored or a source popped up um, from GW. Um, what I would say is this. The rumor has it. We have three additional AOS armies coming down the line mm -hmm. this year. Yeah. Like a army armies. As um, opposed to. 
Well, like as opposed to like an expansion. Oh, okay. as opposed to like like a couple kits. Gotcha. Which we've okay. Seen before. I understand. Um, and so one of like what I'm saying is is battle tome releases, battle tomes with kit releases. Sure. Um, one of those is Night Haunts, which we've long suspected. Um, that that would that makes sense given the gaps in Legions of Nagash, given kind of their own stuff that's going on. It makes sense that that Night Haunt would be with that. Um, potentially with that new starter that we've heard is coming this summer. Um, the the potentially the Stormcast Night Haunt uh, box, which realistically, like we could not, we could get new Stormcast in that box without a true Stormcast release. Right, right. No, absolutely. Yes, yeah, hundred um, percent. That because, was what I, mean, I realized too. It could be a couple characters or one kit or something right. like that, right? For these guys, right. yeah. Right. It could be a couple care, a couple unique uh, models. Kind of think about like uh, Horticulus. Horticulus yep. was out in the in the Blight War starter box for almost what four months before we got him in an individual kit. The Relictor, the Relictor was in their initial AOS starter for over a year before he got his own kit. Same right. thing, you know, with same with Vandis. Um, yep. And so we re realistically, we could have a partial like Stormcast starter, like new kits in the starter release. That's not without without an actual release to back it up. Sure. Yep. Yep. Um, because when they did release the Stormcast book last year with that uh, collector's edition, they said it's going to be a while before we get another Storm Stormcast book. Um, yep. And that would that would seem to point to that. Um, so Night Haunt in the nearer future, and then Slanesh, Slanesh, and then Moon Clan. Yeah, uh, in some order like that, but yeah. yes. Yeah, 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 in some order. The, so there's Moon discussion Clan of like, is Moon Clan before Slanesh or whatever, but yeah. Most are in agreement, Night Haunt is next up on the block. And I mean, yes. we've seen a lots of parts of that. And we've and we've felt like uh, Slanesh was October-ish. That was, that was, that's always been kind of the suspicion. Um, and this would seem to confirm that. Moon Clan, we could easily have before or after. I would probably actually expect Moon Clan before Slanesh. Um, yeah, the rumor is like September for Moon yeah, Clan yeah, after yeah. basically after August, but before the end of the year. So, yep, that's what and that's what I'd expect. You know, the bad mood shows up and heralds dark things, and then boom, Slanesh is here. Right. Um. So yeah, that um, and then that maps that we've gotten a pretty significant release across the board for um for each of our heralds, right? <laughs> Um, um, I mean, really, the Lord Lord Ordy would be the only one then who didn't have something specific. Yeah, I mean, but the yeah. Dark Oath. I mean, I guess I don't know what the chaos, I don't know what chaos maps to that. She took control of a Slaneshi horde in one of the stories, right? And so we have we have potentially Slanesh coming, is what I'm right. pointing out. And then we have Moon Clan, so it would actually make sense that then the heralds are serving to kind of point the way for releases, right? So, um, yeah. So those are hypothetically coming down the road. That's what the rumor has it. Um, and also an interesting rumor popped up. We don't have a lot of evidence for this. There's just people talking about it. Chris Tomlin got real ex excited on Twitter about it is that we may have an iron jaws expansion coming. Yeah, um, this, this, this was a hot rumor that I was not expecting. Somebody yes. dropped this hotness. Yeah. Four to five. Um, the talk is, is that the potentially four to five new, this is just blows my mind. If it's true, four to five new iron jaws kits. Mm-hmm. So the total range of scrolls would basically go from about seven to about 11 to 12. 11 to 12, which would move it up to like a KO size force, which would make sense. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, look, I, I I thought about this one a lot since I heard this rumor earlier this week, right? And it, it's interesting to me because I was like, huh. I don't know that I feel like I have an Iron Jaws army. Mm -hmm. I'm happy with it. I have about 2,000-ish plus points. It's a little mm -hmm. over, but it's not much. And I was like, I don't know that I feel like I need more. Like, I love my Iron Jaws where they are. I've always felt like it was a rich enough experience. You know what I mean? Like, I appreciate its simplicity. You like, like punching <laughs> things in the face, and it lets you punch things in the face. Yeah, these are brutes. These are pigs. This is bosses on on or not on Maw Crushes. We go from here to there and punch things on the way. Great. Yeah, so... Well, I was thinking about this, and I'm wondering if that if they did do an expansion like this, if this would like slot in to like September as well. So like a butted up against the Moon Clan release. See, I feel like they'd let the Moon Clan go free, and they do this this these guys in early 2019 or something. 
Maybe. Like, this would be a minor release they could drop for January because they don't tend to do full releases in January. They just drop. That's, the, that's the most silly thing you've ever said. The last two years they've done full releases in January. Nurgle was not a full release. It was a half army that was already there. <sighs> yeah, I, I'm sorry. Was Nurgle all new kits? Was Nurgle KO? Or was a bunch of the Nurgle units that they already exist? They redid a bunch of kits. Okay. And they and they and they, re, and, they re, and they released a number of heroes that were not previously available. Like sure. they released like uh, for new available kits for like eight kits or something like that. Here's my point, including the a problem, getting started, getting uh, getting starter box. I agree with that. Here's the problem. What do you got in January? What's the, what are you trying to capitalize on if you're a business selling stuff in January? Uh, you want to you want to pick up uh, Christmas dollars. Correct. You want everybody's Christmas money, right? Okay. Right. So you can release one big army, which is dumb because the only people who are going to buy that are the, whatever slice of your population is interested in that. Right. Right. Or you can scatter shot small releases over the, over the month, right. For a bunch of different stuff like character, but clam packs. But they've never done that. A board game. Like, and or like la that. The last two years, they've not done that. This last year was Nurgle. The prior year was Zinch. Both of which were build ons to other existing things. Now, given they got their books at that time, but right. uh, I would point out Iron Jaws don't have a full book right now either. Right. I mean, they have a book. I have it. But yeah, yeah. It's not a real book. It's it's like the one of the last of the not real books. And so, I, like, I understand. So do you think that it would be like a clan? Like, you'd have clans as your subunits? Like, your subbuilds? I don't want to see that in every book. Please don't do that in every book. Oh well, it's it's set. Like if they do that, it's it's done. I mean, like we don't need that in every book, right? Okay? I I understand what you're saying. Like the books, like the, the, but it's been their design trajectory for the last couple books. Please don't repeat yourselves every time. Like let's explore a new design space. Like the whole clan enclave, blah 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 thing we've done in Daughters and Edeneth and all of that. That's fine. Skyport. Sure, but we didn't do it in Nurgle. We didn't do uh, it in Death. It's true. It's true. So, like, no, I, I don't want it. No, I don't need that. It's fine. Like, it can just be whatever it is. Can you hear me okay? Well, there we go. Am I yeah. All right. It yeah, doesn't I mean, need to be that concept trotted out. Sure. All I was simply acknowledging is that they, um, if they went with a release of Iron Jaws, but up against Moon Clan, they could do something a little bit closer to um, the Legions of Nagash design. So rather than going clans, they could go with more of a, a Green Horde uh, approach. Iron Jaws should not have a Legions of Nagash type style. Iron Jaws is its own thing. It's strong enough to so be. You don't think they should have the big wog? No, I do not. No, I think Iron Jaws is its own thing. I think if I was looking to solve the problem of generic destruction, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, that I would solve it in a similar way. I don't have a singular figure to build everything around like I do with Nagash, right? But I could do a book called Rampaging Hordes, right? And I would throw in ogres and unaligned git mob and other things. And just like I, everything that's not a very well-defined subculture, like the Iron Jaws who can have their own book, like the Moon Clan who can have their own book. Those guys are big enough. They're their own concept. The problem with death was it was too many sub factions that were just split out everywhere. And that's the problem. Everybody in destruction, except those few have. Sure. sure. No, I hear that. What do you think, Paul? Um, I think they could just release a Gork and or Mork model and build a destruction book around that in the same way that they did with Nagash. Bam. There you go. Million dollar idea. GW. Remember yeah. I, is the only one that has them. Sure, and I'd be great for that. Just leave out the Iron Jaws and leave out the... Um, or, or make them allies. The okay. Great Wall would be the super book. Yeah, it, it, exactly. I agree you can, completely. You can still have death stuff that isn't in those legions, by the way. Right? Like yeah, Night yeah. Haunt and you Soul Blight. You can still Blight have Iron Jaws running on its own. That's or they fine. In a big wall. Yeah, that's fine. Like, if some of the things can be included tangentially, great. But there, I, I solved, don't like, need them rolled up. They can you, be their you own You solve the spider fang problem. You solve a, a lot of the problems by doing that. I agree. That's what I'm saying. For everything else is not those two. Yes, thumbs up. It's the way to go. Agree. 100%.
I am with Paul. I am with you. I think that would be a super sweet idea because you're right. Suddenly spider fang and all these weird disparate ogre things would, would have a purpose, right? Because you could just, you could just roll up themes, law types or destruction horde types, right? And it'd be great. Yeah. I mean, I would love to see like the regular ogres get some kind of. Nope. Never, never going to happen. Yeah. I mean, they're just too vanilla. Yeah. Like there's, there's, it's not that everybody has to be even at deepkin level of crazy, but like regular ogres, I'm sorry. I know lots of people love regular ogres. They like to fine. drink and, and like carry stolen guns. Yeah, but perhaps unpopular opinion, like regular ogres aren't interesting to build a whole book around. Sorry, Gutbusters fans. I know you're out there. Um, but I but like they're just not a whole book. In, in in this realm, they're not. Like now, if you show me something interesting, cool happening around a story with the ogres, where like you could have like the volcano eaters or something, and they're led by a fire belly, we can bring that weird thing that has its own dumb sub faction back in, or like, you know, like <laughs> Uh, or like you could have like the mercenaries, like you bring back a Golfag's mercenary type, right? And it's ogres yep. who are just hired swords and they have yep. like man eaters and all this stuff and they're sell swords to all yep. of the realms. They fight for anyone and you have a big destruction list and they have some orcs mixed in there too. Man, now we're cooking with gas. Like that sounds interesting. Now we've taken what is just like just ogres, which on its own isn't an interesting concept. And made it interesting through the narrative and given it a shell to work through. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying ogres are all bad. I'm saying that they need a bigger narrative to work through. And that Legions of Nagash style thing could be the way to do it. Well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I was alluding to, although right. briefly. Like, I, 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 even if also, just as sort of an aside, even if they just got allegiance abilities in GHB 2018, like... Yeah. I'd be cool with that. Like they're basically unplayable right now, but they're. Well, I mean, like you can mix them in. Like you have to go mix destruction. There's almost no other way to do it. You do some ogre bowls or whatever, or whatever they're called, and yeah, call it a day. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so, but speaking of destruction, we also have rumors of potentially grot bag scuttlers coming in 2019. What? 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 Like I need that little sound effect when we say that because, like, that is what. What? When this rumor dropped, I was like, man, that first of all, shout out to Paul, who I don't know if he's watching right now or not, but yeah, boy, is Paul he gonna be happy. Yeah. 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 You're gonna get some models, buddy. Yeah, he's like, well, he's already converted a whole army. So like he's gonna day one, he's like I'd had like three quarters of his army made. Uh, because he had converted that whole KO army into Grot Bag Scuttlers. Good on him. Uh that's a crazy rumor. Now that I like pirate goblins, <laughs> flying pirate goblins, flying pirate goblins. Uh, you can stop selling. Like that sounds amazing. <laughs> I mean, you have to have some foil to the KO, right? Like you right. Have, some, have to have somebody raiding those sky ports. Absolutely. Um, the great sky wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude. And like the goblins would be the ones smart enough to do it. Right. Like they're, they're the, they're the cunning, but brutal ones. So like they'd get up, they'd figure out how to make something float and get up there. Like that's, and you know, there was that old picture that a lot of people shared of like the John Blanchett of like the flying goblin yeah. ships or whatever, which I've always loved. It's a fantastic piece of art. Uh, and I think that would be amazing. Well, like I, I that would be a deep kin level of awesome release, right? You no, know, I agree with that. And like there there have been jokes about like instead of them having balloons, having them like helium filled squigs. And so their balloons are squigs <laughs> that have been overinflated. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's incredible. Like the balloon would be trying to eat people. <laughs> uh yep. You, you know uh, what image I would love them to work with is the uh, I'm gonna go way back in the day in Magic the Gathering. Remember the Goblin Balloon Brigade? Yeah, dude, absolutely. <laughs> like this is a time tested tradition. Go goblin bombs, exactly. Yeah, just goblin and hot air balloons are they're they're coming to Warhammer. Mm -hmm. They've got uh, to. Many a goblin deck was built around the goblin balloon brigade. So I am all about it, my friend. I 
I hope this rumor is true. I yeah. really do. Like we're a ways out. This is probably like a year out because this is probably like the Deepkin release next year. Right. This would be right? like the April time frame. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if that's so, true, uh, I'm probably going to buy that. Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. Are you kidding no. me? If you didn't, I would be so just, they would have to go so left field on you. Yeah. Right. To make it, to make you not want to get that. Cause no, like, that's right. I love goblins. I love goblins. I love airships. Mm -hmm. And I was already planning on painting my Iron Jaws in the Sky Basha clan, right. which is already like in that space of, you know, I was going to do a pirate converted uh, Iron Jaws army. Which, by the by, to return to that Iron Jaws thing real quick, if we do get a new unit, I would hope one thing we got. First of all, that'd be a neat way to release it. They could do like a particular thing, like <laughs> do a Sky Bash expansion, like we did an Extremist expansion or whatever for the where suddenly Dracoth Riders came in. But a flying unit would be great. I would like to have a flying unit with Iron Jaws. That would be cool. Besides the main guy on Mega Boss, like That's winged squigs. No, like um, like little little weird like little weird cockatrice riders or something like, you know, not cockatrice, like the little tiny chickens from D and D, but like the, no, you just want to use your, your chicken riders that you've already converted up. Hey, no. I it's fine. Instant done. But I'm just saying like, sure. No, like little wyvern riders would be cool or little cockatrice riders or something like that. Right. In a world with a maw crusher, a dude riding a wyvern isn't that impressive anymore. Right. That's true. That's true. That becomes like your next level down thing that got yeah. demoted. Yeah, but if we're gonna have have orcs riding some some like comical bird, I mean they've got to be like savage orcs, right? Like they're they're the only ones that thematically would make sense riding something stupid. Yeah, it's got to be something like stocky, you know what I mean, and like yeah. heavy. If it's the iron jaws, like they can't have little little weedy mounts. They weigh yeah. a lot. They're heavy. They do. They do. Lots of armor. Yeah, I don't know. I, I could I could honestly, it, you know, they could fill that hole if they just simply, I still think that squigs could be in the cards, um, even for Iron Jaws, if they had like like mangler squig sized squigs, and they pick up, basically, you don't need to have flying if they, like, in their bouncing, they just ignore, like, they count as flying when they move. Well, sure, sure, sure. There was a there was a really back backwards rumor that I didn't include that got circulated around because it's, I don't believe it but um i'll say it now since you just opened the door for it which is somebody actually mentioned like a hearsay a i heard i heard i heard from somebody squig jaws was the was the only thing that was shared squig jaws so there you go interesting interesting you've heard it here first <laughs> no you did i just said you didn't because I just said I heard it from somebody else. So it couldn't have been here no, first. But the show heard it from me, and then you backed it up by other hearsay. So, just saying, Iron Jaws, squig, squig riding Iron Jaws. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's fine. I'm good with all That's that. That's the news. Good. Uh, yeah, so it was a big news week as far as potential rumors go. And I imagine... Uh, obviously, like we mentioned, Warhammer Fest is coming this weekend. I will be there over in the UK. I fly out. Uh, let's see, I leave about eight hours from now uh, to get on an airplane. So, um, like, my airplane leaves about eight hours from now. Um, That's going to be an awesome flight with all those models on your lap. It's going to be pretty great, yeah. Um, it's going to be an interesting trip through airport security. I mean, it's please don't fine. touch that. <laughs> don't touch that is the like, answer. Like that. That's going to be Vince's refrain. Please don't touch yes, that. Please don't touch that. <laughs> I that, promise that's not a bomb. <laughs> what's in that case represents a thousand hours of work. And uh, I would really appreciate it if you would treat it as such. Thank you. Um, that is half a half a man year of work. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. Okay. <laughs> Um, so yep. like, let's, let's be a little careful, please. Thank you. Uh, anywho. Um, so the, uh, <clears throat> the, yeah, I, I'm going to go over there. They're having that. So Saturday morning, the 12th, this coming Saturday, the 12th at 11 AM, whatever British time is, <laughs> okay, whatever that's called GMT. That sounds right. Let's go with that. Uh, that's when the uh, the Andy and Pete show is at Warhammer Fest. So I'll be there. Um, if they reveal something really cool, 
then I may have a 7.30 Saturday morning Eastern time Warhammer Weekly exclusive. Sure, it could happen. That may happen. I'll go, I'll like, I'll tell my wife that, like, which will be a fun thing for me to like leave the convention, go back to a, my hotel room, right? And and kick my wife out so I can do a show with you. That'll be, she'll yep. she'll just love that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It'll be great. Yeah, that'll be a real winner for my vacation. Um, and you're married. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, at this point, I think she knows what she signed up for, but that's when that is. So uh, I would expect if I was all of you out there, I would expect the news to start rolling out between 11 a sorry, between 7 a.m. or sorry, 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. Eastern time. There you go. Yeah, that's right. OK, there I translated that. OK, so speaking of which uh, things we want to share, let's talk about some pick of the week. So, Paul. Paul, hey, what do you yeah. say? Um, you know, I actually had to give some thought to this because for some reason I just have not been consuming a lot of Warhammer content recently. You are so, a terrible person. I <laughs> know I am. Um, so I just kind of wanted to give a general shout out to all of the events coming up in the Northeast United States in general. Okay. Um, we've got Triumph GT coming in first weekend in June that is already over 30 pre-registers. Nice. Um, Crossroads GT just uh, opened up registration. I believe that is in September. We've got Du Bois, I believe is in November. Um, and I know in Connecticut, we've been running a lot of, uh, we've been running a league. I've got a tournament I'm running. Or actually, it's really a narrative event that I'm running in like a week and a half on the 19th, uh, doing a like one day path to glory event. Just doing like six one hour rounds. Nice. Um, gonna make it interesting. I still have to actually like write the tournament pack, but there's a lot of ideas up in the noodle. Um, so yeah, I mean, I feel like for a while there has just been like nothing going on in the Northeast region of the United States in general. Um, and then when I was talking to, uh, Martin Orlando, he's the guy, uh, running the AOS event at Triumph. Uh, he's like, yeah, we're over 30 pre-registers and it's still a month out. I'm like, holy crap. Um, they have a soft cap at 40 that they think they may break. Um, and they potentially have some room to, you know, like move, uh, you know, some table assignments around and uh, if uh, AOS ends up going over 40. But uh, yeah, man, it, that's shaping up to be a surprisingly large event for happening in New Jersey. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, I'll link the Triumph, uh, the, the Triumph uh, GT has a site, right, that you people can link out to? Yes. I will throw the link for that down there. So if anybody's in the Northeast wants to go out there, Martin, I know ran a really good tournament last year. I know he's putting a lot of thought and effort into this one. So I'm sure that if you're anywhere in that general area, yeah, and you want, are at all interested in going to a fun, engaging tournament, it would be a good way place to go. So, um, I will, I will, uh, hunt that link and drop it in the show notes. So I would be remiss. The nearest one. I'd be remiss. Like we, uh, I've Nash Con is coming up next month. Um, it's like four weeks away, three weeks away for those that Which are, I will also include the link for. So if you're not in the Northeast and instead you're in like the Midwest slash mid South, yeah. you know, around the Nashville, Tennessee area, then you yep. should go to this one. Uh, I will be and there. I didn't mention this at, uh, either, but we need to pay attention. This weekend has a number of AOS tournaments worldwide as well. Um, so in the UK, uh, South coast GT is this weekend. Um, which is always their largest one. It may be the largest one in the world this year. Um, Adepticon had 164. Um, I don't know what South Coast is. Um, I think that their signups were, they had a cap of 180, but they weren't near that last time I heard. So they'll be big. They'll be butting close to each other. Yep. Yep. It's a question of like probably how many people show up, but it's going to be huge. Now, I don't know if anybody's going to have. Is, are they allowing uh, Deepkin at this? I don't know if they are or not. Mm -hmm. Are they? Okay. So, I thought so. Um, I know some. I thought I saw some people that had stuff painted up for South okay. Coast. Cool. So. so then we'll see them for the first time. Then there. 
Um, oh yeah, so- and, and from the uh, from the comments, by the way, Flying Monkey in Wichita, Kansas, June twenty third to twenty fourth. War Games Con in Austin, Texas, August seventeenth to eighteenth. Nice. There's yep. so many events. Uh, these are so like if you if you have events that aren't yet listed on the U.S. events list page that uh, Scrubby and Wells maintains that Tyler Emerson maintains, um, reach out to at Scrubby and Wells uh, or email us and we can pass it on. To and we can pass it on to him. Yeah. So that way we can make sure to get your list onto the big, you know, U.S. wide events list. Um, that that uh, is hosted by Dan, who does AOS shorts. So, absolutely. Uh, good stuff. Is that your pick, or did you have anything else you wanted to share? Uh, I mean, it, that's basically my pick. No, I, I knew you were good. I was moving to the top. Self-promotion of my channel. <laughs> I'm, I'm on it. I'm on it, Paul. I'm on it, Paul. I, so my I, have, I have three subscribers away from 500, oh. at which point something may happen. <laughs> I haven't really decided yet. I might do a thing. I might not do a thing. It's a really a surprise. So you really, I want to, I want to see the surprise. So I'm, I'm going to pimp you, Paul. Uh, our guest obviously is Paul Conti. For those of you that don't know, Paul, he has a wonderful channel. He hosts a show every week that we are trying to replicate ish. this week. Every ish. week ish. Yeah. It's not every week. Um, no, but we're trying to, we're trying to replicate it this week. His show is called war hammered, um, where a bunch of people get on and drink and talk about Warhammer. Um, and so I want to encourage you all to uh, go check it out. Um, I was not on it this last weekend, um, but I was on a pri- I've been on prior shows, um, and it is a uh, it is always a uh, a, a ra- raucous Russia raucous raucous is right. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, raucous good time. So very good. I out. will link Paul's channel as well as that in particular down there. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, yes, I could not take part. Because I was playing a game this last weekend, and it was a good time. I got basically double teamed with my daughters, which was that doesn't sound right. Uh, yeah. But you that, look, don't worry about it. Don't read into it. Just it was a fun game full of lots of murder. Anyways, uh, what the, do you call that act? Well, I would say, given the way the board was set up, I kind of got pinchered in like this. So it was sort of like a, as though, like it was almost like people came in and collapsed on both sides for me. And that's of enemies high fived over top of me in the middle, whatever you might call that. I don't know. That's uh, up to you. I would have called it the aristocrat. <laughs> sure. I, I hear that there are landmarks named after that. I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know anything about any of that anyways. So, uh, my pick is, uh, is actually, I want to, uh, pimp out Victor case who Victor has a lot of great hobby content and everything like that. But mm-hmm. Victor just recently published something that was totally awesome. He need, he just threw up another one today, actually, but it's called blast from the past. And he went back and looked at the like second edition Warhammer 40 K box. And like, it's massive. All the stuff he has. And like, he pulls it apart. He walks through the rule book, the piles of like templates, the dreadnought. That's a little cardboard cutout that you stick into a thing and you move around. Um, it's really awesome to look at. So, like, if you have any interest in uh, that sort of nostalgia of that very old stuff from, like, the very late 80s, early 90s, it's an awesome little trip down that memory lane. Um, so, uh, check that video out. I'll link it. Um, it's really cool. He goes and, like, shows you all the supplements from that time, everything that came out with the second edition box set. And, like, because it was, like, the basic game and then Dark Imperium or something was the name of the one that actually had all the rules. But it's cool. It's a really cool thing. So there you go. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about some hobby time. Tom is busily responding to a comment, I'm guessing. Uh, all right. So, <laughs> so Paul, you're what are you working on, buddy? Oh, uh, I am currently working on some of your favorite bros. Yours and mine. Storm bros? No, no. I don't know. I got I gotta grab something appropriate. Yep. Yeah, yeah, this one is appropriately. Vince. Oh, Jesus, God. <laughs> Working on my Blake Kings. Mm. So you were Blake. addressing Tom with a favorite bros comment. Got it. Yeah, I... Uh, Working on my Blake Kings to get them all painted up for Triumph. How many got do you it. have to go? Um, I've got... 
one group of five totally done two groups of five that are most of the way there one that is primed and zenith old and one that is still in a box so that is a total of 25 blight kings that are going to be hitting the table yeah i assume the- that's what you were aiming for total so yeah mm-hmm. yep. uh, i face be- i face the 25 blight kings list like three weeks ago that's a lot of meat that's a lot <laughs> of meat <laughs> crazy amount of meat um I also this last weekend actually won half of that uh that Double dog pile, yeah, that hit my daughters of Cain. Uh was uh like the flying armada or whatever. I don't know what it's like the, the fly the pus Yeah, the Puscoil swarm. Right. Yeah. So he had um he had like eight Puscoils plus the Lord of Afflictions uh, and then uh, other stuff, but he, so that's a lot of Puscoils. They were, I mean, it's it's tough to cut through, I'll say that. That is a lot of like eight Puscoils is a lot of Puscoils. Yes, it is. <laughs> that is a lot of stuff to try and kill. That's yeah. uh, a lot of wounds of Puscoils. Like 64. Yeah, and... Four up, five up, no less. Right, oh, exactly. Probably four up, five up, five up. Like, if I were to take a guess. Uh, you run in the general, the the named... Or the... Uh, he used it. So, oh, what's, what was really ironic is he did have um your dude, your homeboy that you like, the Harbinger. The Harbinger. Yep. He had him in the list. But he didn't use him as the general. He used the... Um, is this Tom? It is, yeah. Come he on, used the, Joker, What are you doing? He used the Lord of Afflictions, the general, because he wanted the movement buff. Yeah, on, the point. Just, no, I get it. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, but we then why is like, the, We were playing like we're long discussing way, Nurgle say. lists here, but then why was the Harbinger even in there? <laughs> he had the extra model and the points, I guess, and that was what he decided <laughs> to use it on. I don't know. You know, sometimes you play with what you got. You know, I don't know. These people in their suboptimal lists. So yeah. Like, oh, geez. <laughs> Darn you all. Um, but yes, it was. Uh, so that was fun. Uh, so you're working on that. What else are you putting together in that list? Like what what follows the Blight Kings? Uh, it's um, a rough draft of the list is, you know, the 25 Blight Kings in a uh, Plague Touch Warband with uh, Festus, Harbinger, um lord of afflictions and um uh why am i blanking on the name probably the beer uh the deep strikey guy oh a gut rot spume yes gut rot spume and then a uh, great unclean one gotcha nice nice do you already have your guo done and ready to go or is that a, is that a oh yeah he was, he was my first nurgle model that i painted nice way to start with the big boy all right jumping right in oh. with both feet Oh yeah, I love it. Uh, awesome, man. We'll, we'll we'll have to watch how that progresses along. Frankly, if you can get through the Blight Kings, you're you won. You've won the war, right? At that point, like yeah. then it's just mostly single characters or whatever from then on out. So, yeah, well, you're I mean, good. the Blight Kings basically are single characters on their own. It's true. They yeah. are they are some of the most beautifully like they're gross. Don't get me wrong. I cannot look at them, but I even I must admire their sculpting. I mean, they're beautifully individualistic models, right? Yeah. Yep. And they all have like very unique alternate builds too. So you can have like a ton of them on the board and they're all the same kits and all they really have is the same legs. You know? Right. Yep. It's funny. You compare them and Wrathmongers who were both kind of released with the same idea. They were sort of that three wound at the ri- originally, like, you know, the, the bigger heavy infantry thing when they came out originally at the tail end of eight and like, the Blight Kings are so interesting and, and so unique as a kit. And the Wrath, the Wrathmongers are just so dumb and boring. Just They're just like wacky waving inflatable flailing tube men with, uh, with chains on the end of their arms. So, whatever. There you go. You Tom, win some, you lose some. Sure, they can't all be winners. Tom, what are you working on? What You got to say something, Tom, so people that, can That's what here. I did. I'll lock the camera on you. There you go. There you go. This week... The witch elves is happening. I well, I mean, she got prime and an undercoat. <laughs> Way to go, dude! You were my to... test model like that. That's you just been hammered all week. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a rough week. I guess. <laughs> hey, I put like I painted hundreds, like a lot of models in that Ko Force up to very high quality. Um, <laughs> oh my god! Like what? <laughs> 
I love hey, that as my favorite excuse. I paid I, stuff. I deserve. Before. I deserve a vacation. That's all I'm saying. All right, man. Whatever you got. This do, last buddy. like month and a half has been a vacation from the work. I um, guess this is what I got. That's what I got. I have a a very purple witch elf. Well, you got one one sort of down. So there you go. I have a bunch of others that are ready to prime. I just need to get the scheme down. There you go. And you you got plenty of salt for that uh, margarita you're gonna have. <laughs> it's a mule. <laughs> she's these hipster drinking us all over the place here. This mule. All right. So uh, awesome. Uh, no, that's good. It's good, Tom. Uh, I'm glad to see you got like sort of that test down and I, I want to see how your test model comes out, buddy. I hope you share it with us. Um, I finished up obviously some more snakes. I did take a unit of 10 snakes this last weekend and love them. Uh, I loved those 10 snakes, man. They were good in round three and Drakey Ganeth. Let me just say it's separate show, but mm -mm, good anyway. Um, so, uh, but uh, I finished those. I finished up the model for uh, Wellesian Wars for the best overall. So I'll take that to Nashcon so I can give it to the winner. Um, and then I'm going to paint a model for one of the winners at Nashcon. That'll be decided by David, not me. Um, but so I finished up all that stuff over the weekend. And I only had like a couple days before I was leaving. So I didn't want to like start painting something new and leave a project half finished for a week. So instead I thought, you know what? It's time to get assembling. So I, I went Avengers assemble mode and uh, spent this week just assembling and priming stuff. So I have here the most expensive Seraphim uh, <laughs> unit ever assembled. Uh, there are five of these. Okay. Uh, so here you go. There's another one. I've got five of them total. Uh, these are my Seraphim uh, who with their double guns, they're using the um, Necromunda uh, Escher gang heads, right? And uh, all the bodies are St. Celestine with St. Celestine's wings. So this is five St. <laughs> Celestines. All of my Seraphim will be St. Celestines. So I did that. Got those girls going. Uh, I assembled my... Uh, I have that project. I'm going to do the one-week Greywater Fastest Army sometime this summer as like a hobby cheating project. So I assembled my Lord Ordinator. For that, I didn't want him to have the uh, the normal human guy head. I didn't like it. I actually like a Stormcast head better on him, so he's got the big, crazy mohawk. Um, so that's him. Nice. Uh, that's um, the exact opposite of the motif of my uh, Stormcast army. Sure. My no. list. <laughs> sure. Uh, I assembled my other five... Um, what are these girls? Uh, heart renders. Canary. Yeah, yeah, my Canary heart renders. Uh, I... We're not done yet. Uh, I put together my steam tank, my plastic steam tank, one of the, one of the three that I'll have to paint for the, uh, for the gray water fastness army. Uh, and then I made bases for everything as well. Like I made a bunch Are you of still going to do your speed, your speed paint army. Yeah. So like, here's the base for that steam tank. And this, I didn't get primed because it was still drying, but you know, so he'll go on there and, uh, yeah. So it was just a lot of assembling and I did about. Like, oh, I did all the bases for the infantry, uh, stuff like that. So just a ton of assembling and priming. So when I get back, I can just work on whatever project I want and I'll be ready to go. I can just pick up a thing and, and work. And then I don't feel like I'm actually in the middle of anything. I just feel like I'm ready to go. So it's been a very productive week for me. I've been very happy with it. So there you go. I, I put purple on a single witch elf model. <laughs> I made 25 bases, uh, assembled uh, like 14 models, and primed them all, Tom. What are you doing with your life, buddy? In uh, addition to painting I mean, everything. Tom's hobby level is almost as high as my three-year-old's. Right sure. Almost <laughs> on equal level. <laughs> Oh, well, I want to interrupt and say I want to give a shout out. I actually have like some of my local Lexington folks in the in the chat. Nice. Which, like that's awesome. So Chris, uh, Michael, glad you all could join us today. Very cool. Uh, I dig that. So welcome. Welcome, especially if you're first time people. Welcome to all the people. All right. So, gentlemen, I think it's time we talk about some mixed order. What do you think? Shall we pivot? 
Yeah, we can mix yeah. it up. All right. We're pivoting. Here we go. All right. So, uh, exactly. Everybody turn around in your chair. There you go. All right. So, swivel. Uh, so the mixed order, you know, order is an interesting, uh, grand Alliance because obviously it's huge. Um, but in addition, I think it's one of the ones that has strong sort of mixed allegiance capabilities. Uh, I think there are a couple that can go this direction. Um, but I think order is sort of the poster child for it. We've seen mixed order place fairly aggressively uh, in several tournaments. So when well piloted, they can do well. I, um, what are you talking like, dude? Mixed order was all over the field at Acon. Yeah. Like in the top ten, there were so like in that final round of games on like the top ten tables, there were so many mixed order, and it was and there was a nice mix of mixed order. Right. It wasn't the same mixed order list. It was different right. kinds of mixed right. order lists. Yeah. So that, and, and I've, th as the more I was thinking about sort of the nature of, you know, the, we, we talked a lot before about horizontal versus vertical design, right. And mixed order speaks very horizontally. And I think that order is one of those places where you actually can kind of go either way and it's functional, right. It works how we would expect it to work. Um, yeah. And so that makes it interesting to me because it could be a template for how other factions should be working, I suppose. Um, you have to wonder why Mixed Chaos doesn't fall into the same thing, because they have an almost as big faction. I don't know if it's because weaker general uh, command, you know, sort of allegiance abilities, weaker opportunities, stronger individual sub-faction abilities, like Zinch being so outwardly yeah. powerful. No, I'm, like the stronger sub-factions. Sure. Like, and not only, not only stronger, more expansive. I mean, nowhere else in uh in order you have something that is a, a, as as inclusive as the chaos guns sure i mean stormcaster big and all inclusive but they yes, are they, they are big. big but they are still monolithic like in, sure. in that sense where like you can really get some nice mix amongst the demons and mortal followers of like yep. Zine, for example. sure yeah. so and i think in chaos as well you have less stuff that is just good on its own there's a lot more that's really synergy oriented where you know like it your nurgle stuff only buffs other nurgle stuff but even in if you're like pick one of the four chaos gods you have demons mortals and all of slaves to darkness plus then you can ally in a bunch of other stuff so you can effectively sort of play mixed chaos while still being in an allegiance right yeah, that's a good point. You can sort of like be Nurgle, but actually have like Nurgle's a great example. You can be Nurgle Allegiance and have like four different armies in your thing, right? Like you could have yeah. Slaves of Darkness and Nurgle Demons and Nurgle Mortals and Nurgle Rop Ringers and possibly even some Skaven in there, right? And like yep. that would still qualify for the particular allegiance. So yeah. It's not even allies yet. <laughs> right. Their sub factions have a bigger tent. Right, than, than orders do. Yeah. All right. But anyways, so I thought we'd start by just kind of talking about mixed order viability. Do yes. is it like is it yeah. viable? And well, and why? I want to I want to deep I want to dive into that a little bit. We've we've hinted around the edge of it here. So Paul, you're the guest. I want you to start off. Because I know you were just scheming out some mixed order forces. So what draws you to yes. it? Why do you think it's viable? So I kind of like there's like three different buckets of mixed order in my head. Um, like the way I, I see it, you have the, the armies that just don't have allegiance abilities. So I'm thinking like uh, Bretonia uh, up till recently daughters of Cain uh, devoted of Sigmar, all of the high elf stuff. Things Swift that talk. Really Swift talk. Yeah. Swift talk. Um, so stuff that really is like a functional force that's cohesive that just doesn't have allegiance abilities. Um, that you're still effectively in an allegiance, but you're not... You you have to be mixed order, technically. You're still within the order and alliance. Then I would... The next bucket I would put it in is uh, lists like... Um, or well, like Tom's list from Adepticon where you're um, kind of either taking two different allegiances and mixing themed, them together. Mixed order is what you're going for. What's that? Themed mixed order. 
So it's mixed order, but you're still sticking within like a certain kind of umbrellas where you maybe you're smashing smashing two or three factions together, but you're largely still siloed. Yeah, or you're just taking something as your main core force and you're just taking more than your 20% allies. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, like, I, that's what I've been personally scheming a lot with free people. Like, I'm not sure that it's necessarily worth it with free people to stick with that allegiance when you have so much other good stuff that synergizes well with it, that puts you way over you know, in a 2000 point list, you're 400 points of allies. Yep. Um, and then the last one that I would really put in there is like, um, uh, Byron's list from the heats. Um, and a few other people that we've seen where it's basically just like best of order. Yeah. Um, where you've got just kind of like a smattering of everything that has some synergy with each other, but it's just like you have a, a deep bench and you just pick the best stuff to go with. Yep. Um, to, to add on to that, I would say that one thing that order really has going for it is that they have um, a lot of just really efficient top performers that are easily kind of grabbable in each of the categories. So like yeah. if I want a good wizard, there's a handful of them that I can go to in order of both low and high point cost stuff. If I want a good ranged unit, you know, there's some stuff that I can invest at like a low buy-in like Judicators, or I can go deep in like Arcanaut Company and get good value for my range stuff. And if I need a tanky unit, I can go light into a tanky unit and grab like a small liber liberator unit, or I can go deep into a tanky unit and grab like long beards or something like that, or like Voltites. Yep. You know? Um, if I need a mobile unit, I, you know, I have options like, and so what I would say is with order, I find that the scale is there all the way in all of those categories of top performers. You can actually like move the, move the marker, move the scale on each one of those to come together just perfectly. From like, from like a little smattering of it, I need a small anvil all the way up to like this is a this is a centerpiece of my force an unbreakable unit you can do right. that like and you right. and they have that range with an order that's just not necessarily the case and and what i would say is this and they often will synergize well enough with each other um that you just don't see that as much in um in other factions you know like so what helped my list my mixed order that i ran at acon this year um was that I was largely in three silos, you know, and so I had these kind of distinct buffing units where I still had like inter faction buffing, but it allowed me to kind of mix and match and move things as needed. Um, and that's just not as easily achieved in a lot of the other sub factions or a lot of the other grand alliances for that matter. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. I think they also do, which we'll talk on later. Like we've got a section of the show. I want to touch on this specifically, but I think order does power pairs, which we, you know, sort of this thing that we've talked about a lot better than almost anybody where you really only need like these two units, maybe these three units, they can be fairly small and they can suddenly uh, that synergy of that little grouping will punch way above its weight. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can deploy lots of these from across the sweep of order. Um, and I think that that makes it really effective. Um, shout out right here to the sustainable center who also was recently talking about the sort of scheming on his channel. He had a video scheming out his own mixed order force. And he sort of wasn't thinking about it like this is what this is in the framework he used, but he was absolutely power pairing it out. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Like in the yeah. way he was doing it, he had, he had a sort of offense defense utility sort yeah. of, you know, speed kind of uh, chart up there. Um, and I think that's fine, but what, and it speaks to exactly what you you're saying there, Tom, at the same time, he was hitting both of those buckets, right? He was able to fill the offense, the defense, mobility, utility, et cetera, and still getting them in the sizes he wanted and the roles he wanted and still fighting the pairs. Right. So he's able to achieve all those multiple ends. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. Cool. Uh, so on top of that, let me just say as an aside, Order does have this very unusual situation where they have a handful of units that are just universal buffers. Yes. And it's this really weird kind of situation that you don't find in a lot of other Grand Alliances. Sure. And so I think about the Luminarch, which is just going to cast a bubble 
for all order units nearby. That's a ward save. Yep. The Archmage is just going to cast a bubble nearby. That's a ward save. The Lumina or the Huracanum is going to be a plus one to hit across the across the board. The Lore Master is going to be a buff that's reroll hits and wounds for one model targeted. So that's not keyword dependent. And all of those small things are like you're not going to build an entire like wing, like a power pair with those. Those are going to be something that you're going to add in after you have all your power pairs lined up. Right. To further push these combos over the edge. Little force uh, multipliers, right? Force multipliers. You know, and like this is again just I, I'm just gonna speak from experience because this is you know what I did. But we, you know, I had uh, my dispossessed, I had my fire slayers, I had my KO, and then backing all of that, I had a uh, I had a luminarch. And it was that thing that I could I could shove behind any of those other units and use it as a force multiplier. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um so because I've I've often thought about this the weight that uh that the vertical sort of design is putting on the game yeah. of these books with like big faction allegiance rules and heavy command traits and artifacts and bonus spells and all this sort of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But somebody um, you know, shout out in the comments like um, you know, Oathstone just mentioned that in five years from now there'll be so many armies and models. You, you'll be able to build an army of like one super unit from like sort of 10 different factions or, you know, you can pick the sort of Paul's idea of best in breed, right? Mm -hmm. Across the thing and have that be the winner. So I think it is important. Like, thralls. That the, like, sure. thralls, you know, like I'm thinking about thralls now, like they're a great utility unit. Sure. Which I, they're probably going to come up on our list here in a minute, but yeah. it's, it shows why it's relevant for individual factions to have strong rules within themselves when you stay tight, right? Yep. Because those, all of those are pulling against the, the allure of just taking best in breed across and building a super force, right? And like, yep. so the, the weight of the individual thing has to be better than what I can get by reaching out across all the rest of everything. Yeah. To make those still viable. And so your individual faction rules, arguably, like some would say that that's power creep. Um, that they're that the individual factionals will have to scale and get better as they go. And it's true, but it's not necessarily power creep. It's because the power creep of the diverse force is going to grow. Every like that is a linear growth. Like every time you add new diversity, you're creating new synergies with what is already there. Right. Sure. R regardless, right? Like, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yep. So let's start it out. Let's hit a couple. We, we've already sort of transitioned into it. Let's pick some, some, some of our favorites. Like what are some ultimate winners? Let's do a couple rounds of like, we'll just jump through, pick out a couple and why we like it. Like pick some, some hot takes, right. Of some individual superstars. You already mentioned some of them, Tom. So Paul, what are your, what are your superstars out of the order lineup when you're looking for a best in breed type of pick? Um, one of my favorites is uh, out of the compendium now, the uh, Bretonian Lord on a Pegasus. Um, he moves 16 inches. Uh, he did, His scroll did not get changed when uh, the compendium update happened, and he's still 140 points. So he moves 16 inches, five wound hero, three up save. Um, he's... On the charge, he's throwing five attacks, three up, three up, rend one, D3 plus one damage. And I usually like to throw the artifact on him that gives him an additional plus one damage. So he can put out just like an outrageous amount of uh, firepower on a very mobile, small, unsuspecting body. I dig it. He's also on a like, but yeah, base three up save. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's a he's a solid dude. You're you're not wrong at all. Like, I mean, uh, again, there's always the possibility that these Bretonian scrolls are going to go away. But it is <laughs> funny how when you go to mixer, like, and if that happens, that happens, right? They can't. Yeah. Right now, they are perfectly valid in an order army. Uh, you've either got them already, you've either owned these models already, and you can you can run this stuff, or you're probably not getting your hands on them. Let's be realistic. Um, but yeah, he's like, he's a solid choice. Um, he really is like, I would also like, yeah, I mean, three up base, he's rerolling ones in combat phase. Yeah. He's a good dude for, for yep. like you said, the point package on him is not bad at all. 
you know, 140 yeah. for that move. I'm going to have to jump in and say the Volkite Berserkers um, are sure. just such a great buy. And, and more or less on their own. Like, they can be combined with some other things for additional right, value, right. which we'll talk At about when we get power gears. Like, but, you're going to drop 330 on them. You're going to get a battle line, generic battle line unit that's going to have uh, 30 wounds with a four, uh, a four up grinding combat save. So it's a five up base normally, but when they get into combat after a charge, or even if they receive a charge, it's at a four up base in combat. And then they get a four up ward save until they've lost 10 wounds. Um, they're at two attacks a model, neg one rend, four up, four up, uh, one damage each. Um, and then most of the time, you're going to back them with a rune smiter at 80 points. So you're going to pay 410 for the combo. And you're going to be able to deep strike that 30 unit wherever they want. They don't have to set up within nine of that model. So you can string them out. You can cut the board in half. You can do anything you want with these 32 mil bases. Like you can take control of the board with these guys. And that rune smiter, it will perpetually buff them with a re rolling all wounds. So they go to like, you know, four attack or two attacks a model. So 60 attacks um, at fours and then uh, re roll fours on the, or, you know, re roll. Uh, the wounds. Uh, the other thing that most people is unsuspecting with this force is their short range firepower. Uh, you know, like those shields, are to hell. <laughs> like those shields are a bit because, like, they do real mortal wounds. Um, right. I killed, I killed a uh, tree lord ancient in my thousand point game, like the super buff tree lord ancient. Like, I was like, oh, I got to get rid of him. And he was like in my back line. And so I just dropped him and just obliterated him off the table with shields. Like, I didn't have to tag him. I just like, I had to put a couple wounds on him. And I was like, okay, bye. And they all threw their shields. And he <laughs> just okay, <killed> bye. <laughs> yeah, like, no, I'm not dealing with that Tree Lord Ancient. Whatever. I, I give up the primary objective. I can't make it across the table, but I'm just going to get rid of this. Um, So, and th that's the shields. But that's actually not what I'm talking about, Paul. They actually have an eight inch throwing axe. That's fours and fours, no rend one damage. And so when you drop, you know, like when you drop them, you're not gonna normally gonna get it. But you know, that like that doesn't seem a lot, but that's 30 attacks. Yeah, fours sure. and, fours, and they're re-rolling all of those fours to wound. So 15 yeah. are gonna 15 are gonna wound, and then you're gonna normally it'd be seven, but actually you're gonna get closer to like 12 wounds off of stupid throwing axes even on a four up save like a four up save monster they're still going to put like six wounds on that thing before anybody gets into combat yeah. like it's they're actually going to do damage um and so uh, a lot of people have really trash talked the uh the their hand axes but man like i've seen those hand axes do work yeah no i it's a bunch of extra stuff on an like it's a bunch of extra here's why it's you know, you you spent all a couple weeks back bagging the Namardi Reavers, who basically have just a bunch of shots that are on fours and fours, and you're like, these guys are pointless. So somebody might be like, well, why is it okay here and not there? And your answer would be because in that case, that's the whole the fours and four shots. That's the meal. That yeah, right. that's what you're buying. Right here, this is just like this is just some parsley on the side of a steak, <laughs> right? Like that's seriously like look if it shows up. It's onion straws is the better answer, right? Like if you ever get a good, a nice steak and it's got like some mashed potatoes and some onion straws, that's these shield, that's these these hand axe throws, right? Like that steak is still going to be delicious with or without the onion straws, but they're nice to have. Right. That's exactly right. And like, it's just so good. And like, heaven forbid you're near damn train or something like that. Sure. You know, like where suddenly those hand axes are doing in, in against your, against somebody that has a terrible save. Suddenly those hand axes are doing real work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, so my pick is perhaps my, my first one for my winner is something that goes in the line of what you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, but he's a little more, but you, you didn't mention him. Like it's, it's in the same sort of vein. Um, so the Excelsior war priest, uh, <laughs> out of, out of silver tower, you know, Get what I'm talking the about hell out of here, Vince. you shut your face. This guy's 80 points. He's 80 points. Okay. He's a cheap hero. He's a five or he's a five wound hero on a four up save, and he has a generic healing prayer that works for any order model and a generic mortal wound thing against chaos. Okay, he can also okay. dispel. There you go. Okay. 
That's cool. I mean, I or you can get a battle mage that can do the same thing and also Mystic Shield for 100. Uh, he's 20 points cheaper. And that's what I would say. And like, that's not nothing when we're dealing at this level. Look. And, they I, heal, and, and the battle mage's heal also gives a ward save on that unit for the next turn. And the battle mage has like a six up save compared to a four up save. Yes. And that's a big difference. Look, I all I'm saying is if you think the battle mage, if you would ever come to me and say the battle mage is, is in this list of good stuff with that you should look at with order, which I think it is, by the way. Like mm -hmm. the advantage of the battle mage, I think, is actually in some of the other spells. I don't think that one's actually their good spell. Right. I think the I think the good battle mage spell is the wound spell and the battle shock immunity spell, depending on your build. But right. like, cause he would certainly, he's certainly going to show up on my list. But like, if I'm just trying to get a healing battery guy, yeah, he's, fine. he's cheaper oh. and he's more durable. Yeah, I, I hear that. But like, okay, so let, I want to push back. Um, so another one of those generics that are just king right now. Um, that I didn't mention. It. Sorry, Paul, I'm skipping you. Uh, in the mix, <laughs> in the mix stuff are phoenixes, right? Sure, Phenai, sure. The Phenai, Phenai. Um, and the big thing with the Phenai is like right now they're super undercosted. Uh, they can do some damage and they're hyper durable. You know, they have a base five up save, but for every spell that's cast within 12 inches, like half of those spells are going to give them an additional plus one to save. Um, and so like the battle mage, you know, like if you want a healer, the battle mage is still healing and he's triggering the Phenai's buff, you know, like it's a I fair get, point. Like I, like I understand the value of the priest. Where the priest's heals can't be dispelled, like that's a that is an advantage of the priest. Like his his heals can't be dispelled, where the uh, where the battle mages can be dispelled. But there are other synergies that are there that like I don't know. All I'm saying is I think he ranks in the same. He should be he should be talked about in the same breath. If you're that's all I'm saying, because I think there are as yeah. there are as many ups and downs. Better save, better move. Uh, prayer can't be dispelled. Also does more to wounds against chaos with his little with his little prayer drop, right? And cheaper, by the Paul, by. Paul, Paul, I want to hear your opinion. Let's go. Um, I am going to give a shout out to the organ gun. All right. So now, why the organ gun specifically, as opposed to like, as opposed to any of the other artillery we could pick from, like the <laughs> hellstorm or anything like, like the that? Rocket battery. Because I would pick the rocket battery in a heartbeat. I mean, obviously. We'll just get this out of the way. The problem with all crude artillery is there's if somebody has an ability to splash mortal wounds around you, your crew just dies and that thing becomes... I, I have a story about this, but continue. We accept that, but well, let's move on. Why organ gun over Hellstorm? Um, it, it is the weakness of the crew issue. that I, It's a little tweak that I'm not sure many people really notice, but the... Dwarf War Machines, the crew have a base five up save and they're considered within cover when they're within one inch of their artillery piece. So they have a four up save. And for 120 points, the organ gun just maths out to a lot better damage than you might expect. Within a how much range? I don't remember what it is. <laughs> uh, that's the real, that's the real question here. Uh, it's twenty four inches to be exact. Um, no, it's yes, it's twenty four inches. And the reason why I know this is because in my thousand point game at Acon, I played somebody that had these, and I felt so terrible because uh, he he could. It wasn't possible for him to get it within range of me because I had a higher mobility on all of my stuff, and so I just stayed out of range and shot everything else, and then just moved in and shot the crew when I got tired of it. It's, tw Actually, it's no. 28 it's, inches. No. no, is it 28? 28. Well, like, it's 20, is it 24 with a four inch move? No, it's 28. It's legitimately oh, is it 28, 28 inches. Okay. Uh, still, uh, it's not long enough, is the answer. That's like, I mean, because reality, like, so, then this is just you know so you remember uh Paul I'm sure you remember this when we did the uh when we did the Oz Hammer show um yeah. and we talked about our lists and compared and stuff like that yeah. I ran into that list like what you ran like in our in our matchup and I just did to that guy for the first two rounds like what I talked about which is just shot him and stayed out of range and oh yeah it felt bad and he just like he was a GW like, he was a store owner and so like he was a store manager so he he thought it was funny. But the reality is, is that like, that's the problem there. 
Um, and that those crew, like I just splashed, like I used drill cannons and just yep. splashed mortal wounds onto the crew. Like I didn't even target the crew. It's like the, I was like, I shot other stuff. And yeah. Yeah. Them. I mean, calling it an Achilles heel is an understatement, right? Which by the way, is the, if there's any defense of something like the Hellstorm, it's that facing anything except deep can you can, and there, if there is a, any potential way to hide that thing, you can put it out of, uh, completely out of sight and still free fire on the enemy. Right. Yep. yep. Um, and like, it's surprising to me. I face a hellstorm pretty frequently and it's surprising to me how often I can't get that thing unstuck. You know what I mean? Like it's, he's put it in a position where it's like, it's completely hidden. And I don't have, even if I have ambushers, like there's no good place to set them up where I'm not just going to throw the unit away. And that thing is just free firing the whole dang game. You know, if I don't have like some way to get over there and get at it. And you have to put an inordinate amount into it in order to dislodge it from that hidden spot. Yep. All right. Because yep. it's behind the porcupine of everything else, right? Real quick, I want to answer a comment. Somebody in the in the comment said you'd pick a relictor over the priest every time, over the Excelsior War Priest, because the relictor also has the neg one click on the back of his thing. The difference being, and the relictor is also eighty points. Like, and admittedly, if I was pure stormcast, yeah, certainly, yes. Um, the problem is the relictor's heal only hits stormcast, whereas the war priest heals any order, as does the battle mage, right? That's the yep. that's the advantage. Um, yep. So, like, I oh, do think that's a tangible difference. Nice. Right. It's a tangible difference there. Um, okay. So the, all right, but no, that's right on. So Paul, you, you, you've got, that's, that's your pick. I, I think the organ gun is defensible. I don't think it's terrible. But my problem is it has to be in sight and it has to be relatively close. But again, that's like saying, Tom, your point of like, it's bad in a KO matchup. Well, like, okay. Yeah. Other people's minimal shooting is going to be bad against people with good shooting. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. a lot of armies where that thing's going to overperform, or or other mixed mixed order that have strong shooting, like, and that's what I'm saying, like, and that's my challenge with with that with a lot of those, like all like everything that requires line of sight of the siege engines, and so the hellstorm I would say is exempted from this, but anything where you can snipe off crew. If they have any type of strong shooting on a mere ma matchup of like mixed order, they're going to clear your crew. Yeah. And that then that's going to be simply a wasted set of points. Or like a Nurgle Mortal Splash, because there's a lot of Nurgle spells where like, or Nurgle oh. abilities, Rodigus and their spell that they have where and they can just like wheel and pick all of some them. number of units and do a D3 Mortal Wounds and it's like pop goes your crew, you know, sure. Yep. Yeah. Um. It's just, it's rough. Like there's just not like... It, it's it's too unreliable. It's too for me at least when I think about competitive. Like it's too matchup specific. All right. No, that's fair. Um, but yes, I I get it. I, I I think that there are still that crew dependency varies in the level of its Achillesness, <laughs> right? I think yeah. that is true. There are some is and and as and I think you were right, like things like the Hellstorm that can just sit outside of line of sight are really hard to unpry sometimes. All right. Here's my here's uh, my can, I, can I jump in real quick? Go, man. Uh, so AOS coach said KO can't be the measuring stick for AOS. I disagree. And here's why. When we're talking about mixed order, you can cherry pick anything. So yeah. they do become they do become measuring stick. I mean, but by that definition, anything is. And by the way, KO are probably on the downswing right now, given the new army that just released. Pure KO, yes. Sure. But like as a splash in a mixed order force, yeah, sure. No, there's oh. there's probably a lot of heat there. Oh my uh, God. Yes. I can't wait to I, I can't wait till you try to trot out and defend some ridiculous KO unit in here. Uh, uh, I am. I am. I'm about to I'm about to bring some heat, Vince, but go ahead. All right, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to pick another. I'm going to pick a non-controversial one that I just want to get out there. Uh, I'm going to pick a non-controversial one first. I think the Way Watcher. Yeah. Does anybody have a problem with the Way Watcher as a, no. as a hot pick? This no. dude is a solo operator, ridiculously durable for how stupid he is. Cheap assassin. Like this guy has range for days. He's your crew nightmare because that, that guy's going to be like, nope, thump 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 thump, dead crew. Moving on. Do, 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 do. just walk along be hard to shoot down little mobile you know ridiculous guy yeah way watcher solid uh i dig that guy 
Yep. I'm, I'm going to double take it real quick because the way watcher is non-controversial. Now I'll go for a slightly more controversial one real quick. Tree revenants. Tree revenants. That's Most my pick. people view those in Sylvan F as attacks. I hope you know that. Yeah, I, not spite revenants. I think oh. those are attacks. Tree oh. revenants. Oh, so you're talking about the um, the reroll one dice of phase. Uh huh. Um, now they have lessened utility outside of pure Sylvan F because their ability to way pipe yeah. is why I'm still picking them. Now, without they when they way pipe, they can come back in in a woods or on a board edge, right? But they can just pull themselves out anytime mm -hmm. and come back in on board edges, right? They can like literally rip themselves out of combat and come back in on a board edge. Yeah, you won't have woods. I don't disagree with that. And yes, there are a shockingly low number you of still could have woods, point. by the way. Like if you so slash uh, an ancient, you could still have woods. Yeah. Sure. Well, you'd have to pay for them, but yes. Um, because remember, like outside of Sylvan as Allegiance, they have a sure. point cost, but sure. But like, whatever, you don't need them. Like board, there's a lot of board edge, surprisingly. Every board has four edges. Yeah, hot tip. Um, boards come with those. There are <laughs> four of them. Um, they they're pretty much the enemy deployment zone has some of them near them, guaranteed. Uh, and they have two attacks a model. Like they have two yeah. attacks a model. They're gonna throw down some shit. Like they're gonna do some damage. Um, yeah. Like ten of them are gonna throw out twenty attacks. Um, and they're gonna be annoying because they're gonna get to re, re roll dice and phases and yeah. Yeah, they can more easily land that nine inch charge if they want to get back there. They can they're great like late they can you can just hide them around and they're great like sweep in from an edge. They tend to make longer charges because of that re-roll of one of their die during the charge phase, right? Yep. And uh because you're just gonna roll your charge die and re-roll the lower one, right? Yep. I mean, obvi. And uh and and they're going to be pretty efficient at killing like a character or a small chaff unit or something that's back holding a back point yep, in a game. Yep. or like sweeping in and getting a, a relatively lightly defended scorched earth point or something like that. Right. Um, I, I think they have a use. I think they're highly mobile and interesting. So there you go. That's, that's my, that's my perhaps slightly controversial pick. Okay. I'm going to dive in. Um, Arcanaut company. Of course. Of course, yeah. I don't. I don't think that's a controversial pick. I think Arco are like good. I mean, they're pure battle line. They're pure battle line, so they're a generic battle line for order. They have a they devastating a like special gun. They bring three of per ten, right? Yeah. So if you have a block of thirty or forty, which is what you're going to run, so three hundred sixty to four hundred eighty points, you're and you're probably going to have them backed by that hero, that magic kind of pair, the power pair. Um, so they're going to drop like 18 shots at threes and threes, neg two, ren, d3 damage. Like against, uh, so they're going to assassinate a monster or a hero every turn within 24 inches of the unit. Yep. Um, yeah, I don't think Arco or I think Arco are perfectly and, fine. And by the way, you know, like that seems like that's really good. Um, but the fact that they get 43 pistol shots within 12 inches at fours and fours <laughs> like you know when i was talking about that short range like the, uh so when i ran again when i ran my mix order i'm i'm highlighting the units that i picked because i feel like they're some of the best units in order like that's the you know like i i don't haphazardly like yes it looks like i just threw my list together but there's there's a sense in which like i feel like they're some of the best units in the game and what ended up catching my opponents unaware wasn't the fact that i had long range that was obvious you know, they could see the 24 inch on my on my on my army. But if I had like my Volkites as my front line with my Arco behind them, I had over 60 shots at fours and fours. Like of within you know eight to twelve inches. And so like my short range was just off the hook. Um sure. I mean it's only 15 wounds, but it's still 15 wounds. That's 15 wounds of not my primary attack. Um, and yep, again, it's good splash it's, damage. It's great spot. You know, it's great. Like, it's just great killing and clearing. Sure. Um, extra stuff. So, uh, them, and then uh, as a corollary to them, and this is going to be my a little bit more controversial unit, um, is Sky Wardens. Yeah, this is, I knew you were going to pull Sky Wardens out. This is the one I was waiting to bust you on. Okay. Um, there has to be something else in order that does this better. Maybe. Maybe. So I ran a block of nine Sky Wardens at 300 points. 
And so originally I was running in my, both in my thousand point and my mixed order, I was wanting to run uh, engine riggers in this like utility spot. Mm-hmm. And the, but the problem with engine riggers is they die real quick. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's like way too quick. Yeah. Way too quick. They're, you know, turn, you know, if I have a unit of engine riggers that live past turn three, I'm excited. Yeah. They're um, suicide troops. Certainly. They're suicide troops. Um, but sky wardens are a, are a, um, they have a great mobility. You know, they're a, tw- a 12 fly and they can do just about anything I need them to do when I need them to do it. Um, from a 20, they have a 24 inch range gun, which means their reach is 30. Their threat range is 36 inches. Uh-huh. They have, they're going to shoot six of their, um, six of their drill cannons with neg three rend. Um, sometimes it's going to do a couple wounds. Um, sometimes you're going to one shot like a mirror shielded, uh, this happened, a uh, mirror shielded, uh, like Celestin on Dra- Dracoth. Sure. Because I, sh- I shoot in a, a unit and I roll three sixes, which means they, they splash three, six mortal wounds onto an adjacent unit. Right. And you just delete something else that w- you weren't supposed to be shooting. 18 shots at fours and fours, make one red and one damage. And on top of all this ridiculousness, they still have seven attacks at fours and threes, neg one D three melee. So once they actually get into the shit, if they get in, they will wipe any unit of like any 10 wound unit. If they get into them in melee on top of their range threat. And the key is is that they're going to be out of combat for the first two to three rounds, just moving and shooting. And then they're going to dive in when it matters, where it matters, put the pressure and wipe whatever it is. These guys, by far, at at Akon for me this year, were my MVPs in every single game. I I I feel like it's a controversial pick, but I don't have anything to counter you with. So okay, we'll say sure. Like because I was super critical of Sky Wardens, and I felt the same way, Vince, until I had them on the table, and they were always where I needed them when I needed them to be. Sure, sure. With the reach that they needed to have, and so um like. And I like to be clear, I ran these guys in the morning Vanguard place third, ran them in the evening Vanguard place fourth, ran them in the in the uh, in the 164 person 2K and place seventh. Sure. These guys were in every single one of those lists. And by far, they are my MVP in every single matchup. I feel like they have a very similar sort of role to uh, Skyfires where yeah. they're they shoot far, they do a lot of damage, and they move fast, so they're hard to catch. Yep. And, you get and they're threatening enough in melee. And you get nine of them for the cost of one and a half units of Skyfire. <laughs> because it's 300 points for nine of them. Right. Different wound profile, obviously, but yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right. But if Paul. people want those, I'm happy. Like, if sure. they want to put wounds into those, like, cool. Yeah, I hear you. I want to go back to Paul, because we got we to move it along. We got more to talk about. Paul, yeah. what's your next pick? What's your standout? Let's do what? Let's we'll get we'll get Paul's, then we're gonna move into power pairs. What do you got, Paul? Uh, you know what? I, I am gonna stick with uh, you know the old standbys, and I am going to say Grail Knights. Yeah, this is something that I saw recently too, and didn't really think about it. They're an interesting pick. <laughs> they're they're five for one eighty, right? Yep. Yep. You want to talk about them? Why do you like them? Uh, they're five for 180. They're basically as good as they've ever been, right? They got their shield changed uh, with the scroll updates. So you're just re-rolling ones on the charge instead of plus one to save on the charge. Um, so their profile stays the same. They're uh, two attacks each, three up to hit, four up to wound, uh, plus one to wound on the charge, uh, they're always rend one. Uh, they do two damage on the charge, and against demons and death, they do plus two damage on the charge. So they make death and demon units explode. Yeah, yeah each model doing three damage is pretty crazy. Like three damage regular troop, basically, right? Yeah. Yeah, there. It's it's such an interesting callback to that compendium scroll. I like. The wound to, uh, the wound to like, to point ratio is a little bit off where I'd like it to be. 
you know, I mean, because they are they are four up base, right? And so the reroll ones is cool, but I feel like they're a little squishier than I would want them. That being said, I can't hate it. Like yeah. they're an interesting unit for their for what they're doing. Yep. And uh, I mean, my the other thing to mention too is that they charge on three d six reroll or uh, yeah. two highest. Yep. So their their average charge range is about a nine instead of a seven, which is really powerful. I mean, I've actually run these quite a bit, and yes, they are a little bit squishy. But the only thing you really have to worry about that squishiness with is like long range shooting. Are um, they ten or fifteen? They're wins? Pretty much killing everything they touch if they get a charge off. Are they ten or fifteen wounds? 10 wounds. That's the problem. That's what I'm saying. Cause there's, they're only two wounds a piece. If yeah. they were like, um, if they were like, like if they were like chaos knights or, or blood knights or something, Oh man, yeah. I would be in for these guys. Like there would, you would, any reservation I have would evaporate. Right. Just, just immediately. I would be like, these guys rule. But I mean, that's why probably they're not like that. <laughs> yeah. Cause they don't want to make a compendium unit that good, but, but yeah, it, they're it, interesting it, still. And you can still take a damsel and give him a five up board save as well. Right. Yep. And that, that spell goes off on like a five, I think. Yeah. It, it's it's super easy to get that spell off. And, and, and a damsel is 100 points. So they're with, you know, doing the power pair thing, they are they're pretty durable. They're doing a lot of damage. They're really mobile. I don't know. They they've always done what I want them to do. Yep. Yep. Well, that's a good transition into power pairs. It is a good transition into power pairs. Uh, because you mentioned the damsel, right? Which um which is sort of which is the cheaper caster who can back them. But yep. since we're talking about Bretonian casters, and uh then we have to mention the enchantress. Yep. Right? Who's 160. But she's a double caster. Yep. Okay. She makes it so any Grail Knights within 10 inches of her re-roll all failed hit rolls. Not, not that's not the spell. That's just a thing she does by existing. Okay. Um, as she um uh she can re-roll a failed casting roll every round of her two spells, and her main spell casts on a six. And can give those same Grail Knights plus one to hit, right? So <laughs> they're twos and threes. Yeah, yes, twos and threes rerolls on the twos, right? So pretty efficient output there. Like you really want to land them th the two or three damage wounds. Uh, she'll do it. Like she takes them into power pair city. So yeah, I yeah. dig that. And again, she's a double caster on her own. Double casters are always good because they're double casters. She yep. just keep double caster in order. Um, like 160 for a double caster ain't a bad deal. So it isn't ever a bad deal. No, no, in any in any alliance. Yeah. Like you do not see a lot of double casters unless, unless you're Zinch. Sure. With but I mean caster at like 120 points. Oh yeah. But uh, the um uh, summoner. Oh yeah, yeah. I was thinking, how much is this guy? 140. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I think it's funny you knew who I was talking about. Uh, all right. The Muppet Man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So. Uh, Village. The cursed. The cursed. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. You knew what I meant. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, I could have done this, right? He could have been like, eh. um, that might have been more appropriate. But anyways. Um, all right. So that's why. So Paul, what's your what's your first pick for your actual power pair? Where are you going? Since I just uh, I just threw on top of yours. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I'll steal one that Tom's probably going to pick um, and go with Executioners and Hurricanum. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, 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 Paul, tell us about the Executioner Hurricanum combo. Yeah, why is this good? So, the Executioners are throwing two attacks each. They do two mortal wounds for every six to hit they roll. Um, and it goes to a five if they're plus one to hit because it's six or more. So 
if you got a block of them getting into something with plus one to hit, they're doing two mortal wounds for every five or six you roll. Uh, so they just melt stuff. They have to get into combat, though. That's the tricky part, admittedly. Like, but with a that four inch move. like a four inch move or five inch, sorry. Five inch, yeah, they're five. Uh, no, sorry, they're six. I apologize. They're All elves. Right. What am I thinking? They're six inch move, yeah. They're elves. They're elves, yes, of course. What am I thinking? Uh, okay. I would also state that remember, on their charge, they get to re roll one of the die of their charges. Okay. Um, so like, again, you could, you're going to reroll the low die. So you'll tend to make longer charges. You have 50% chance at a, uh, at a nine inch charge rather yep. than a 50% at sevens. You're at 50% at nine. Yep. I know I that mean, because Volkites have the same math and Volkites are 50% chance for a nine inch charge. Yeah. Like that's, it's pretty good. And like, admittedly 30 of them is a scary block that demands attention. 480 points. Yeah. Um, and uh, I know this because I faced we faced it down in the team tournament. Vince and I did, and it was a scary um, block that demanded attention, like and, no and doubt. It, and it and it got engine riggers uh, in the face. Twelve. It of did, them. sure, yeah. but I mean, you know, my point is, is that like, yeah, they are like they'll do work. Yeah, you have to deal with it if you don't. And there were like eight left at the end, and they still like melted. Like yeah. I still lost all of those riggers <laughs> right i know you <laughs> cut a bunch of those dudes out and then the remaining dudes were like go to work choppy 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 yeah yeah, yeah. uh those guys live that that with, uh, any plus one to hit buff or was that just normal well i mean they like to be clear it's not the them that killed my riggers they they killed some riggers, but then the warlord that was super buffed up next to him obliterated my unit. Sure, but nonetheless, that I would point out that that unit of executioners did win them the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it survived and won them the game. So uh, just saying, it got there in that game. Uh, yeah, no, I I don't I think executioners are interesting because they, you're right, like they're begging for that hit buff. And what's interesting about that power pair is it's not a demanding power pair. Like it's not a tight lock. Right, like the Huracanum's broadcasting that plus one to a lot of other people. You know what I mean? Like, it's yep. not like it's just buffing the executioner. And uh, and the Huracanum can also bump their save like a three up if it wants to. Yeah. Uh, right on. All right, Tommy, what's your power pair? Um, like I'm just gonna go with what I've already identified. Um, my two like highly efficient units, uh, the Arco Company and the um, Sky Wardens, both benefit from a uh. An arc, uh, a aether chemist, um, aether chemist to just add plus one to attack, and so you know it'll double the shots on your on this tw on your on the main twenty four inch guns, like whether yeah. it's the drill cannons, whether it's the light sky hooks, um, and and what a lot of people don't realize is that like those chemists in short range, like one or two, like each chemist has three d six shots. So, like, attacks, they have 3d6, so they're going to put out 10 attacks on average at 12-inch range at 4s and 4s with neg 2 rend. And so, like, I, I had Free Lord Angel come in at me in the backfield, and that my chemist just turned, he was like, ha-ha, boom, 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 boom. You know, it's neg 2 rend, so, like, that's going to actually do work in that instance and put enough wounds to, to thin, you know, to weaken things out. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it's a really swingy shot profile, right? Because you will get those random turns where he puts out, like, 16 shots or something ridiculous. Like, yep. that will happen. And then that only, like, with me, I was running two chemists. So, like, man, that short-range profile, like, talk about swingy. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. And that works with any of your big KO, like, uh, units, whether you're running Indra Niggers or whether you're on a Wardens, whether you're running Company. Yep. So. Uh, we mentioned it earlier, but I think it's worth exploring to the end here. Uh, from from a, new, a new hot pick, like, a, a new contender has entered the ring. And that's, uh, I would argue, Thralls and the the, the Scryer. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, the Scryer's ability to walk the Thralls off, the off to take them off table and bring them in, you know, as it were, to ambush with, with Thralls is a is a scary thing. And I, to me, it's the Thralls are your ambush unit, and if you're picking from here, right? Because, again, the Thralls are fulfilling sort of generic battle line in this case. Um, they're pretty brutal by the standards of generic battle line, especially when they suddenly show up um they make your by being off table they make your opponent change the way they play yeah right? because yeah. they can show up and again not only can they show up from any any board edge 
um, you know, they can be zoned out, of course, as always, blah, blah, blah. And as with anything like this, but that's just it. If your opponent's zoning them out, then they're playing differently, right? Because now they went to board edges. They were measuring this movement. They might not be exactly what they want to with all their forces. Um, and they can also lay on charges really well because the scryer can basically make sure that they make those charges. Same thing we've talked about. Like all these people who come up from the off the who can land these charges. Charge, basically. Yep. So again, more easily landing a nine inch charge, right? Makes a big yeah, deal. They'll, they'll land that uh, their nine inch charge like se almost 70% of the time. So, I mean, I think that's, a, again, another one that it's a solid. It really is just a solid power pair. I, yep. I really think so. Uh, all right, Paul, what else you got, man? Hit me with another one. Uh, so, I will reach into the compendium again. Uh, I love it, man. Stop it, grabbing compendium units. No, I'm all about it. Keep grabbing compendium units. Prove to people that there is value in these scrolls. Yes, I'm no, down. They're going away. You shut your face. Keep going. Well, you know, at least I'm not talking about the same units over and over again, Tom. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'll I'll go with a uh, lore master and a reaper bolt thrower. You piece of shit. I was going with going to go with the lore master next. <laughs> All right, explain why the lore master is good for everybody. Because again, so, in a lot of these cases, people might not know some of this stuff. Yeah, lore master is just an old high elf wizard. He has a spell that goes off, I think, on a five that lets one model reroll all of its hits and wounds uh, for the rest of the turn. And one model. One model. Yes, one model rather. Uh, so really powerful on something like a monster or a war machine that happens to be throwing a lot of damage around. Another fun possible pick for this is something like uh, Lore Master and like a Star Drake um, or uh, something else the, ridiculous. The Phoenix, the Phoenix is, is where you want to go. Yeah. Um, like yes, I agree with the monster. The Phoenix is like half the cost, of, less than half the cost of Star Trek. It's going to put out damage with that. The rerolls is on naturally threes and threes. Uh, the difference though with the Phoenix is that uh, the spell itself gives the Phoenix a plus one to save. <laughs> so by casting the buff, it's also buffing the Phoenix's save. Yep. I mean, I just think it would be hilarious to have a Star Trek that's rerolling everything. Because it's not one stat line either. It's like the whole profile. Right. So the whole dragon, the whole guy on top, everything. Yeah. But I mean, the bolt thrower is just absolutely bonkers if you've ever been on the receiving end of it. It has a pretty long range 12 Control. shots, threes and threes, neg one, ren, one damage. And I think every six does two damage. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Something like that. Uh, something that has just like sucked really hard every time I've been on the receiving end of it. Um, it has the the same like crude war machine problem, but it, I mean, you know. Yeah, I would say it's a war machine. It's matchup dependent. It, it's like, thirty six inch range at least. That's the difference. Yeah, you know, a lot of that other stuff. It's thirty six inch range. Yep. Right on. I dig it. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, that's an unusual pick. That bolt thrower is a hidden gem, has been for a while. I just don't think a lot of people read and ever looked at it. But well, yeah, I mean, under the top order list, all had bolt throwers. Sure, I, but that I, I don't disagree with that. But I think a lot of people don't even realize, don't even think to look at it. You know what I mean? Like, right. yeah, yes. how many points is it anyway? It's really cheap. If I remember, one right. twenty. I think. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, that, that seems undercosted. <laughs> Well, again, I don't think you're going to have to worry about it past the next GHB update. <laughs> um, I, All right, I don't. Debbie Downer. What's your Absolutely. <laughs> you're, you are so Debbie Downer this episode with that stuff. You're, like, you're just like... Okay. Mwah, mwah. Okay, go ahead. What's your pick? Um, so my next pick is going to be... Hold on. Let me see if I can predict it. Will it be Volkite Berserkers and whatever okay. dude lets in the tunnel? <laughs> I've, already, I, I've already mentioned that, so I'm not going to do that one. Um, no, I'm going to go with... Uh, no, I am going to stay within the Dwarven family, because of course I am. Um, and I'm going to go with uh, Longbeards and, or, or war, Dwarf Warriors, some large infantry block with Neg One Ren naturally, mm -hmm. and backed by a Rune Lord. Yep. So if you want to talk about hidden gems... 
Let me talk about the Rune Lord at 80 points, who's a four up save, who has an unbind at plus two. Right. Which is a huge bonus to your unbind. Like, that is a crazy bonus to unbind. And who will use a prayer every turn. And on a two up, on a two up, the prayer goes off. And he can, uh, his effect for his prayer is either, which again, this is un, un, undispellable, is either granting a, a six up ward save to a unit or more likely increasing their ren by one. Right. And so he moves either those dwarf warriors or those dwarf longbeards to a neg two ren for the entire unit. Um, I ran a block 30, and it was like a really good 380 points, I just have to say, <laughs> with sure. four up re-rollable base save. Yeah, why ain't you chopping, right? I mean, yeah. that's, yeah. Yeah, but, with neg two rend like that, suddenly, like that's a unit that can do work, and people have to like, okay, what am I going to do about that? How am I going to sure. deal with that? Mm-hmm. And that guy was my general, by the way. Like that four up <laughs> save, like rune lord with no command ability, was my general who was projecting like a, a immune to battle shock bubble. And people had to like, well, do I want to remove him? Because he's a four up save and I he's small. So I hide him behind buildings and like, and if you get near him with a, you try to snipe him with a caster, he's going to shoot off one of your spells with the plus two unbind. Um, and he's, again, he's a four up save, five wound for, you know, for 80 points. Like, sure. I, I lost him in one match and that was against KO. Which is fine. And a, like a true KO list and it took them two turns to kill him. Sure. Yeah, no, that's totally fair. I I agree with that power pair 100%. And it puts a great old, like, puts an older unit that a lot of people complain and want to see useful. Okay, this is, that's a great use for it. There's two classic dispossessed units that are going to punch way above their weight, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that is, because they're also tough, by the by, right? They're, they're, they're naturally, if you go long beards, they're pretty naturally battle shock resistant on their own. Yeah, like, they, they have all battle shock losses naturally. And that unit can either give themselves an additional five up save, like a five up negate battle shock every right. time that they would lose it. So they have all battle shock losses. So let's say they're going to lose 10 models. They only lose five and they gain a five up save on all five of those losses to, to negate away. any of them. So you'll roll five dice and any five pluses you, you reduce those models. And by the way, if you're generic order, you're also rerolling all uh, battle shock saves. Right. <laughs> and so yeah. like you're, like so, you're they're naturally going to resist that. If you don't want to give them that last five up save, they can give themselves reroll ones to all wounds. So they go fours and threes, reroll ones, neg two, rend one damage. Um, yeah, they're punchy. Sure, I think a lot of the dispossessed in general are kind of overlooked. Um, I mean, base four moves suck. And they don't really have a good mobility option. But if you were, you know, running a mixed order force and you had other more mobile things to supplement that, uh, there's some really solid dispossessed units there that, you know, could be a supplement to your force. They could be the core of your force, whatever you want to do. But they're on 25 mils, folks. Yeah. Let's not forget that. They're on 25 mils still. Yeah, um, so they, they, <laughs> they fit perfect in between the one inch gap of your 32 mil bases. <laughs> so like Kenny, Kenny realized this when he lined up a charge and realized that I had stretched my Volkites out the 32 mils and with a one inch between. And then I double stacked long beards in each of the one inch gaps. So coming in at all, and then, like, there's one long beard that would maintain coherency in between each of the pairs in the one inch gaps. And so, coming in at all would pull all of these long beards in, you know, fighting basically two ranks deep. Um, it's it's brutal. It's hilarious. All right, uh, twenty five minutes. Folks. Don't underestimate them. No, it's it's crazy how different being on a twenty five is. That is not a joke. Um, <clears throat> okay, I have a I have a a. Uh, one that I want to talk about that is possibly a power pair slash power triple. Uh, no, something. Trio. Okay. Like it's not required. It's just sort of like some interesting, an interesting grouping when you put them all together. Okay. Not a trois of power. 
Hey, there you go. Absolutely. Well, well, well themed with our earlier statement, I guess, of how we open the show. <laughs> what, um, what, like French landmarks. Correct. Um, okay. So we're going to start with the eternal guard, right? The, the wanderers, uh, you know, dudes with spears. Yeah. Who yep. can very easily be quite tough. And what I mean by that is these are dudes who, even though they're on a base five up save, right? Yep. They can basically choose to put themselves in this little fortress and then they get plus one to their save roll. Um, and then they have their glade shields where they're always rerolling ones. And if they're in cover, they reroll ones and twos. If they get mystic shielded, obviously now we're into ridiculous zone, right? Um, and then the combo there is then with the, obviously the sisters of the thorn, right? Or something like that, um, where you have interesting things happening, um, with the shield of thorns, uh, where you can reroll failed save rolls for that unit, uh, until your next hero phase. In addition, each time you make a successful save roll of six or more for that unit in a combat phase, the attacking unit suffers a mortal wound. Okay. So like these guys have a lot of interesting ways to already reroll, but to also gain bonuses to that roll. So they can very easily trigger those mortal wounds. And then the last one is the, the, their, the other caster, like the spell weaver or whatever, the cheap wood elf caster who, um, who has, her spell actually returns slain models. Okay. Wanderer models. Yeah. Yeah. Wanderer models. Yes. Which obviously the eternal guard are, but also she has an automatic dispel on her. Right. So like, uh, yeah. once per game, if she's in range to unbind, she can just do it. Right. And she's relatively cheap. What's interesting. Uh, by, by the way, I think, uh, that's content, uh, contested. And what I mean by that is it's not, some people are saying that you don't have to be within range to do that unbind. I think that's one of them that people are saying because it just says you can unbind one spell automatically. The The exact text is once per game, this model can call upon these blessings when attempting to unbind a spell, which okay. to me says we have yeah. already entered the triggering phase yeah. of being within 18 inches. Uh, so, it does, so that attempt is automatically successful. Anywho, what's interesting to me about this little combination is that it's, it's really relatively cheap. Like, a 30 pack of eternal guard or, uh, or whatever is 210 points with the horde discount. Uh, the sisters, of the thorn are 220 and the spell weaver is 80. This is basically 500 points for, for, you know, a pretty big block of stuff that can act in a couple different ways, provide you two different spell casting units, right. Is a pretty tough unit that can also reflect back like a pretty high number of mortal wounds. Yeah. Um, and and be relatively because hard that to spell dislodge. weaver that spell weaver can mystic shield and exactly. so what ends up happening is like you get the eternal guard on cover i don't know if you'll ever get them in terrain with 30 models but it depends it depends ideally, on what it is, yeah. like you get them in cover with mystic shield and they're going to be at like plus three to save is that right uh one from their ability one from mystic shield one from cover yes yeah so plus three to their save, which means they reflect mortal wounds on threes. Yeah. Threes and higher on those saves. They re-roll all failed saves. And uh, that's a lot of mortal wounds. Like mathematically, you're gonna you're gonna pay stuff. Yeah. Um it's it's just an interesting sort of exactly, and you need the two casters, right, to be making it work. So you have both the uh, and the spell weaver is an interesting caster that's relatively cheap and has a nice side benefit. So um, who can also, if she needs to start returning dead wanderers, right? If she, if, if you get the opportunity, like, okay, cool. She's not mystic yeah. shielding that round, but whatever she can make dead wanderers come back or dead eternal guard come back, making that unit even more anvily, right? Cause you actually can replace models. So yeah, uh, it's a little more of a power trio, I suppose. Uh, but yeah. still, still an interesting uh, combo in my mind. And and it's and it lends itself to some neat synergy because you could like easily drop some phoenixes in there. Sure, like this builds into the other stuff we've been talking about, right? And yep. the reason I think it's okay with three units because again, it's a cheap package, right? Yep. Like this is a quarter of your army that has a relatively interesting and and tight purpose, and we've still got three quarters of our force to go out and go crazy and buy phoenixes and any of the other crap we've talked about for other purposes. Like right. even at a thousand points, you could run like this with a phoenix and another block of like like bow like some bow unit right 
like uh, of like a, a battle line bow unit or something and give you some range threat, give you a nice infantry block that you just that's going to be unbreakable in this thing and then buffing for the Phoenix itself. Yeah. Yep. All right, Paul, you got any other power pair choices? Or are we moving on? Anybody got any more power pairs or will there or we'll move on to the next thing? Uh, you know what I'll actually throw out there is uh, Fulminators and uh, Night Heralder. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. It is pretty good. It is. Do you want to explain why it's solid? I mean, it, the uh, the Heralder can just let them uh, run in charge in the same turn. And he... And retreat in charge. Is the and one. retreat in charge. Yeah. Um, and the Fulminators get bonuses on their uh, glaives on the charge. So they're doing three damage instead of one. So, uh, yeah, it's a super good combination. And just to add a little bonus to that, the Heralder can also just like toot terrain and do mortal wounds all over the place. Yeah. Um, you know, if you want to turn this into a trio, by the way, the other thing you add then is the Castellan. Um, because it makes those, uh, those fulminators at like a one up, one up. And then with their saves, because they get plus one from their natural ability against ranged so on like natural ro rolls of like five right one two natural rolls of five from yeah. from no five or six no six no i'm sorry natural rolls of four they start healing wounds on that unit as well um depends on what's targeting them but yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yep I, I i dig it no i agree and like those guys, the difference between fulminators on the charge and fulminators caught flat footed is so massive, right? Because they they do not hit that hard. Like if you're if, if you're you not locked in, it's not yeah. the end. But when they charge, they will just blow stuff up. It's again, it's that like moving attacks from one to three damage is a really big move when you're talking about a unit. Like that was the whole point we talked about earlier. And yeah, it's such a massive change. Uh, yeah. that sounds obvious. Tripling the damage is a big deal. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. And it, and worst case scenario, if they do get stuck, their breath weapon is still really good. Yeah, they're gonna spit mortals. Lots of mortals. Tommy, any final power pairs from you? Uh, I mean, I could go on for a while, but I mean, I think that that's uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Let's do um, uh. Uh, croak on a bailwind is that a power pair that's not a shut your face shut your <laughs> face that does not count get out of here uh <laughs> that was almost my choice so uh, <laughs> yeah that sounds both, like that's a power pair, pair then you're both filthy awful people but sure i mean yeah okay croak nato yeah it's real scary like no doubt like it's I don't less think we need to be encouraging that like it's less scary in mixed order when they can't teleport croak around sure yeah. um and put him in like that strategic place at the top of one Sure. Um, but uh, it's still pretty filth. Yeah. And, and P.S. still trying to make Mr. Toad's wild ride happen for the name of that combination. But uh, uh, I, I, seem to be sticking. I, I like the I like your gusto. I like your moxie and try to make it happen. But I mean, that stupid movie was too popular. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> He's not even a shark, but here we are. Uh, all right. So let's talk. So I want to real quickly move through a couple other things here, uh, just to as we sort of start winding this down. Um, I wanted to touch on: Are there any really solid battle line options we haven't talked about? Skinks. Yeah. Yeah, skinks. Like skinks are the the go to for that. Yep. Uh, what? So who? Somebody want to extol on why skinks are so good? <laughs> They're really cheap, and they can run away. They're <laughs> undercosted by twenty to forty points um on an already cheap you know chassis um they have eight inches they're amazingly survivable because of their retreat and they can also throw those short range range attacks if they need them yeah. i mean like they're not really short range like 16 inches but you know they're terrible but you know yeah, but it doesn't matter that's and they're super cheap they're like what 40 for 200 points yeah uh, something like that. so well skinks are 60 uh, per 10 okay right but they're 200 for 40 yes yeah correct yeah they're 200 for 40 yes 
That, that's really good. Like, Stormcast can ally in 80 of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yes. Skinks move fast. Like, they're a ridiculous little 8-inch foot move. They have decent range attacks with a with a fair enough range, especially when you've got 40 of them hucking. Um, and, and the point is where very well taken. Like, their retreat ability is so unique, right, for those people who haven't faced it, where, like, when you activate them, you can just say, nah, we're out, and have them bounce, right? And they can just retreat in the middle of combat. Meaning if your opponent does not choose the suboptimal fight first, right, yep. and attack your skinks, your skinks are going to escape unmolested. Time and time and time and time again. That is you unless you're... Put, you have to put weight into the skinks. Right. That is unless you have small units of skinks and you're, play, you're facing an Iron Jaws player who any smart Iron Jaws player will just choose the skinks first, bash them right off the table, and then smash it and bash it his way right down your line. So uh, it works opposite <laughs> how you want it to. Be very careful when facing Iron Jaws with your skinks. Or if yeah. you totally wrap them with a Vanguard wing, that's effective too. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, but cutting off their lines of retreat. Like, it is possible, right? Yeah, it's not easy. But yeah. Especially if they have a large block. Like, that yeah. 40 block can't retreat if it's, yeah. If it's well wrapped up, yeah, with a similar, t t if it's tangled with another big unit, right? But they can get pretty far with an eight plus D6 movement. Let me just say. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And, and like the fact that, as, as was just mentioned in the comments, the thing I want to talk about, you want to talk about unexpected objective grabbing, right? Yeah. Like retreating in combat onto an objective. It's like, what? <laughs> yep. it's, especially with the ability to sort of like certain objectives could just be gotten by units getting near them right so the skinks yep. can retreat still be three inches away from an enemy and just have a unit of larger than 20 and just body block somebody right off an now, objective. It, the the more offensive thing is the smart player like charging them into combat right and then just and then retreating around the enemy yep like so to close that distance farther so they they like they move eight inches they charge let's say like six inches they're 14 inches in. And then in combat, when you select them, you retreat them another on average 11 inches out and around their unit. You know, now suddenly you've moved uh, math, a math number of inches. A lot. And Vince, you're muty. You're muted, Vince. Sorry, I had blown my nose and I'm muted myself. You can't run on that pull away move. Because you you just you literally move eight inches. It's a set number. But oh, is still, it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. I thought it was you can retreat your normal amount. Okay. Nope. It's it's just a straight. It's a literally like you may move eight inches away, but you say yeah. still it has the normal retreat language of like you have to end three inches away from an enemy. But still, your your point still stands. Yeah, like you can absolutely like hit somebody in the side and then just go nope, and then just do 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 do, yeah. do like and you know pretty easily get three inches away from them, especially if you just like touched into them, right? So, uh, yeah, that's a hot pick. Um, you know, we kind of meant like we mentioned him offhand earlier, but I mean, it, we should just put a pin on the fact that like liberators are well, liberators are a pretty decent battle line unit, right? Like, I yeah. mean, they are. They're kind of like the battle line unit against which most other battle line units are measured, right? So I mean, they're, they're they're literally the unit against which every other unit in the game was costed out. So right. <laughs> so there you go um they kind of almost by necessity have to be fairly well balanced uh yeah i'm coming around to witch elves as uh, a generic battle line sure you're saying like don't don't worry about the nature of them in a in a dock army right you're right, saying just right. straight up uh, i mean in a straight up army like because realistically you know we're talking about power pairs you can pair them for 330 points with a uh, with a, a priest, like a with hag queen, hag. yeah, not a not the slaughter queen, but just a normal hag, yeah, who I mean, can still feed them witch brew, who's still going to push them to four attacks each, yeah, who, yeah, so they're going to go to four attacks each, immune to battle shock, and reroll wounds, um, at uh, what fours and three, it threes? It'd, be, it'd be threes and reroll fours at that point, uh, threes and reroll fours, four attacks a model. Immune to battle shock, like that's for three thirty. That's that's efficient. It's decent. It's pretty decent. Yeah, they'll like. Obviously, you don't get all the benefits of like the super stacky craziness of of doc itself, but you don't need it. It ain't bad. They're they're gonna get in there. They're gonna get in there and do some serious work. That's for sure. Uh, okay. 
Any other battle line choices we need to call out? I don't think so. All right. I mean, there's not a lot that, that hasn't been said. I mean, I know Arcanaut Company are the obvious one, but we've talked sure. about them a number of times. All right. Let's talk about some other sort of like utility or just interesting guys we haven't touched on or pieced out. Uh, so like just any other interesting utility pieces, sort of expansions. Like we mentioned the Huracanum earlier. We mentioned does, Huracanum, we mentioned Battle Mage, we mentioned uh, Lore Master. Does like the aspect of the sea fall into here yeah. or the aspect of the storm? I, I would argue that one of their uh, Eidolons does. Yeah. Sure. The aspect of the storm for me, like to me, that's the new go-to utility wizard. The aspect of the sea, you mean, or whatever. Yeah. The, 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 the caster. Yeah, like I've been trying to fit him into my dwarf list, honestly. Um, because uh, he at 440, 440, right? Yeah, 440. 440 yeah. Yep. Um, yep. He hands out, like you can you can bail wind him. I know you don't like hearing that. You can bail wind him <laughs> and make him like 20 inches tall, which I know you like doing that, Vince. I do like that. I mean, that is super sweet. I have no problem yeah. with that. Like you can bail wind him and give him. Um, like he'll, he'll be at like a natural two up. He'll have a chance to like auto heal each turn. And he's at casting two spells around naturally plus one from the bail wind. One of those spells is like a, was it? 24 inch neg one debuff to multiple units, neg one to hit debuff to multiple units. And then you can, uh, and then you have other spells that you can also dish out as well, including the base spells and a second, uh, named like a second, you know, strategic spell. He has a multiple ranged attacks that can do some damage that are neg to rend. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's not terrible. It's not. Yep. Um, and he's okay in melee. He's just okay. I mean, it, like, and when I say okay, like he could still take an item for plus one damage and have multiple three damage decks. Well, I mean, he's he holds his own. Uh, yeah. Certainly, he's better by far than most spellcasters. Yes. Right. I mean, yeah, he's expensive, but like, he can't just be jumped and dealt with. And, right. he, and he gets a reroll too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what about Paul? You got any other? Yeah, just like some some hot utility piece picks you like. Um, I feel like uh, not enough attention is paid to the uh, free guild general on a Griffin. Um, just because he's really efficiently costed. He is for for what he does. I think he actually is. He is, but not yeah. not compared to the Phoenix, and that's the problem. The Phoenix is just too well costed compared to him. But the, the Phoenix is, is not really an offensive piece, and he the the general on Griffin is. He's got if you arm him with the hammer, he's got the hammer attacks at rend two, and he's got claws at rend two. So he's throwing a lot of rend two attacks around, and we lost Vince. We did. Uh, I mean, yeah, like I hear that. Uh, the I would agree that your Frost Phoenix is in general going to be a more defensive piece, but you could give him like you could you could bump all of his like his weapon attacks. Like I think and he has quite a few of those uh, up to rent two as well if you wanted to. Like and, and it will outgrind anything like almost anything that Phoenix like it does good damage. Like don't don't miss it. Mistake that like the Phoenix does a good damage. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the empire guy, but like, sure. I, I, the point is I could see an argument there. I don't just dis like the, the Phoenix is only going to be really efficient. If you have the spell casting to support him and turn him on all the way. Maybe, <laughs> I mean, he also sits on. <coughs> if you have one spell caster, is he really worth it? One spellcaster who may not be anywhere near him. Uh, is he your general in a generic order? The spellcaster? I, I don't know. No. no, 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 no. Is your phoenix the general? Oh, like, is the the anointed guy on top your general? Because he gives himself reroll wounds. Sure. I I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know. Um. Yeah, I, the point is, I could see the argument going either way, depending on army composition. I think depending on the force, there's a there's a strong argument for that Empire General, because I think the Phoenix does require a bit of an engine to make him really run at his full at his full optimal efficiency at his points cost. Sure, that's what I would say. Yeah. Um, and if you're also in a position where you are the not really running, 
other synergies. You could make the general on a griffin your, your army general and use his command ability on himself. So he gets all the plus one to hit, plus one to run, plus one to charge, um, which is not bad. Is he 280? 260. 260, yeah. Is he 12 wounds or 14? Uh, I think he's 13, isn't he? Isn't he some yeah. weird number? Yeah, he's. He, I think he's 13. Hmm. He's one of those weirdos, I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, is he, oh, is I, he I, 12 inch or 16 inch or 14? 15, I believe. <laughs> I like how I like how you're hitting on both sides of this guy. I mean, admittedly, yeah. Like I'm just trying to to to, to look at his uh, his mobility, like to, to you know to put all the pieces together. And he's a natural so, three up or natural four up. Natural three up, because he has on his scroll. If you read him, he says uh, it says four up. <laughs> okay, right, but if you use a hammer shield, yeah, it says like you can have the shield, and if you do, it's three up, and he can have the hammer with it. Right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, he's 13 wounds, and he's 15-inch move. Yes, you're exactly correct, Paul. I died to bring up his scroll. That Phoenix is just a little bit better in all those categories. Yeah. But again, he's he's an efficient dude. I'm going to shout out another little spellcaster, but I'm going to go for a little baby. Dark Elf Sorceress. Yeah. I like me a Dark Elf Sorceress. She's hot for 80 points. For 80 points, man. She's, she's hot because she's... <laughs> She does as all get out right at 80, um, whatever, whatever on her stats. I mean, obviously she's terrible for all that kind of crap, but the word of pain is why you take her right now, which has a high casting value, like no joke. Her cat, her spell cast on a seven. That is, that's a tough, it's a 50, 50 shot. It's a tough, it's a very tough road, road to hoe, no doubt, but she's got a 60 inch range spell that does a single mortal wound and gives that unit neg one to hit. Until your next hero phase for eighty points. For eighty points, like she's a pretty cheap neg one to hit thing. Now again, is she better than the relictor? That's pretty hard to say in this mixed order thing because the relictor is doing a d three and also giving that one. He's got a little bit shorter range, but and he also it's a natural three up. So he's a lot up. tougher, right? Yeah, and he also the like prayer three up. Yeah, yeah, on the prayer it's three up. He has a, he has a more likely chance to cast it by far. So uh, to me, I would probably come down to the relictor, but I like the sorceress in general and want to highlight her. I think she's fun. But again, I'm afraid in this match, her against relictor, she does lose to the relictor. Probably the range thing is the only thing that gives me pause, but it's not that huge of a difference, but it's there. Like, because these are hero phase actions and happen before movement, you know, if you're out of, if you're out of range, you're just out of range, right? Like it's just, you're screwed. Like that just happened. So, you know, every bit does, can matter because you don't know where your opponent's going to necessarily go if you're not on the double turn. Right. So. Yep. Uh, all right. Any other, any other hot picks anyone wants to share before we call it a day? I don't think so. I mean, I'm sure there's stuff in there that we missed. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, this it's such a huge faction. Like there's, yeah. we can't cover all of it in one show. Yeah. I, so what I would just say real quick is it, it, there is definitely a possible like combo build of like stacking lots of minus one to hits uh, between Stormcast, Battle Mage, and Sylvaneth. I think it's Sylvaneth that has that ability. Yeah, I want to okay. highlight two units real quick before we, we sign okay. off. Yeah, there's a lot of Neg One floating around, certainly. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, Tom. Uh, the first we've mentioned it before, I just want to pin a pin on it is the Luminarch. Um, at 240 points, the Luminarch is a like a behemoth that has a high mobility behemoth, 11 wounds. Um, that is has a 30 inch range laser. That's threes and threes, neg two, rend six damage on a profile. Yep. Um, I uh, I just deleted uh, Nurgle Sorcerers off the table with that. Yep. <laughs> like, uh, you go. You you go. Like, multiple I, times. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've, 
I've just like like spiked somebody's general top of one with a luminarch. <laughs> right, right. Like that luminarch, like that laser, it, it, it's going to do damage. Um, and you also have a six in, or in a nine inch ward save bubble that it's going to project on a really big base on a big oval um, around it. And so uh, it's just one of those great force multipliers. And, you know, and it has a good spell. The Burning Gaze of Shem is an anti horde spell. If yep. the unit you're shooting with that is over six or over 20 models, it does 3d3 mortals. So it's going to do like six mortals on average, yep. uh, which that's pretty good. Um, it's a good way to like take a bite into like that that unit of uh, of plague bearers that you don't want to actually have to like melee or range down, <laughs> you know, just to get like a, a jump into that those 10 models that you need to remove that minus one to hit. Um, and like he can mystic shield. And so like on top of all that other stuff as a utility unit, it also gets, it gives itself plus one to unbind. Yeah. Right. So, and so like, it's naturally to plus one to unbind. So like when I built my army, I included one of these guys and I didn't realize, but I had like plus two to unbind. And originally I had two bat a battle mage and this guy that plus one to unbind. He gives himself. He also gives the battle mage. So I act like, I accidentally stumbled into like a plus two unbind and two plus ones like right. default in the army, not trying to get there, um, which yep. like those small bonuses turn, you know, like that turns the knob. Um, oh, yeah. And so like that plus unbind was just a surprising gift, especially against Nurgle and stuff like that to, to really push against some of their really high DC spells or their high casting, uh, casting value spells. Um, so that's the, the one that I was going to... And the other one that I want to highlight is the Knight of Zeros. The Knight of Zeros is an 80-point unit with a 3-up save that doesn't get a lot of play in Stormcast armies. But in mixed order, he's going to project a bubble, an 8-inch bubble around him that gives reroll ones to hit uh, with all range attacks, like if they're shooting enemies within 8 inches of him. So like in the mixed order list... All of your um, all of your range attacks, which order has lots of strong ranged, can get reroll ones that hit really easily just by an eighty point knight of zeros who's highly mobile. He's a three up save hero um, who can stand on terrain for a two up, so he's very survivable for what he's doing. And in that off chance that you're against like chaos, right? He can pop off a d six mortal wounds in an eight inch bubble. So for eighty points, like. It's really hard to get somebody's, you know, you know, and he has some like he has like four attacks at threes and threes, make one run, one damage. Um, so he'll, he'll do a wound or two if he gets into melee every turn. Um, I really like the Knight of Zeros at 80 points. Yeah, no, it's a good pick. It's a good utility pick. I agree. Yeah. So maybe I just want to put a pin in real quick on uh, the Luminarch and the Hurricanum. Yeah. I uh, did not forget that they have the hero keyword on them. And. Yeah. The number of times that they have, for me, become either in three places of power or duality of death, an 11 wound, four up hero to sit on an objective for a long period of time, yeah. um, that can mystic shield itself. Right. And Yeah, and that four up on the Luminarch is a four up that goes to a three up with a mystic shield and a six yeah. up ward. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. I mean, it's good. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Absolutely. All right. Good stuff. There you go. So we're talking about some best of mixed order. I hope we gave you lots of ideas of how you could. And, and what's cool about this is, as you mentioned at the top, you can build very thematic forces around all of this, right? Like you can take these disparate pieces, bring them together, just like you did, Tom. Like, you know, you had your army, but then and like it was all these different stuff. But your Luminarch looked like a KO Slayer Luminarch. Right, like you themed your whole army around this. So even though you had smatterings from kind of all over, even your Knight of Zeros was like you. You had uh, I can't remember his name, but the from guy Flash from Gordon. yeah, from Flash Gordon. Right, that's what he looked like. Like yeah. you had you had convert this whole thing. So like you, there's no reason you can't theme your whole army around this and have it still work as these pieces. So the possibilities here are endless, and that's what I love about these mixed forces being viable is it, yeah. it opens the doors to all these amazing forces. And for people to really do incredible hobby projects like you did with your last force, there was apparently such an effort that you had to, that you just like, it broke you. But nonetheless, it it's, it was. <laughs> it's a, lot it's of a great project. 
So Rogue I hope Tiger more people explore you. this. Yes, exactly. I hope more people explore it. Paul, buddy, good times as always. I have to head out now. I need to go to sleep for four hours before I get up to get on a very long plane flight. So to all of you out there, thank you very much for watching. Paul, appreciate it as always. We will, of course, have Paul back on. Duh. Nobody, nobody <laughs> doubts that. And uh, as always, we'll see you next Wednesday.